zone standards issued by the EPA. Henry Waxman of California chairing the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. The hearing just getting started. It's live on C-SPAN 3. But what we are all entitled to is a fair process that's based on the science, the facts, and the law. That impartial and rigorous system is one of the critical pillars of our government. Unfortunately, President Bush seems to believe these rules don't apply to him. On key issues, this administration has pushed ahead with its agenda despite the evidence and the law. We know that's what happened on the decisions to launch the Iraq War. It happened again on decisions authorizing torture. And it happened when the White House fired independent and nonpartisan Justice Department officials. For months, this committee has been investigating recent Environmental Protection Agency decisions relating to both global warming and the new air quality standards. And after reviewing nearly 60,000 of pages of internal documents and interviewing officials involved in the rulemakings, we have found evidence that the White House often ignored the facts and the law. The first rulemaking was a response to California's petition to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from cars and light duty trucks. Under the Clean Air Act, EPA must approve California's request unless it finds the proposal is arbitrary, isn't technically feasible, or isn't justified by compelling and extraordinary conditions. Well, the record is overwhelming that EPA's experts and career staff all supported granting the California petition. In one internal document, EPA's own lawyer said, quote, we don't believe that there are any good arguments against granting the waiver. All of the arguments are likely to lose in court if we are sued, end quote. Administrator Johnson apparently listened to his own staff people the committee has learned that before communicating with the White House, the administrator supported granting a partial approval to California's request. But then the White House intervened. In December, after secret communications with White House officials, Administrator Johnson ignored the law and the evidence and denied California's petition. The second EPA rulemaking revised the air quality standards for ozone air pollution to protect both human health and the environment. In this case, EPA's Expert Advisory Committee, the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, unanimously recommended a new standard for protecting the environment. After considering all of the alternatives, Administrator Johnson agreed with this new approach, which is called a seasonal standard. In a submission to the White House, he described the case for the new standard as, quote, compelling, end quote. And he said that there was no evidence from the perspective of biological impact supporting the alternative standard favored by industry. But once again, the White House intervened. On the evening before the final rule was released, President Bush rejected the unanimous recommendation of both EPA's scientific experts lawyers, and Administrator Johnson, and instructed EPA to abandon the new standard. The committee's investigation reveals that EPA officials were astounded by the President's decision and said it wasn't supported by either the science or the law. One official wrote, quote, I have been working on national ambient air quality standards for over 30 years and have yet to see anything like this, end quote. Another wrote, Quote, we could be in a position of having to fend off contempt proceedings. The obligation to promulgate a rule arguably means to promulgate one that is nominally defensible, end quote. And an EPA associate director observed, quote, this looks like pure politics, end quote. The same thing happened in a third critical rulemaking. Last April, the Supreme Court directed EPA to determine whether CO2 emissions endanger health and the environment and must be regulated under the Clean Air Act. This is a Supreme Court decision. 
And under Administrator Johnson, EPA assembled a team of over 60 career officials to work on this hugely important regulation. The staff determined that CO2 did endanger the environment and drafted proposed rules to reduce tailpipe emissions. To his credit, Administrator Johnson listened to his staff and sent an official, quote, endangerment finding, end quote, to the White House. That endangerment finding means that the regulation should go forward. Jason Burnett, the Associate, Depu Associate Deputy Administrator, told the committee that he personally transmitted the Administrator's determination to the White House in December. Yet once again, the White House ignored the law, the science, and Administrator Johnson. Two months ago, EPA was forced to announce that the agency would go back to square one and start the rulemaking process all over again. In each of these rulemakings, the pattern is the same. The President apparently insisted on his judgment and overrode the unanimous recommendation of EPA's scientific and legal experts. Now, our investigation has not been able to find any evidence that the, pre the President based his decisions on the science, the record, or the law. Indeed, there is virtually no credible record of any kind in support of the decisions. I recognize and support the broad powers our Constitution vests with the President of the United States. But the President does not have absolute power, and he is not above the law. The President may have a personal opinion about the new ozone standards, California's motor vehicle standards, and regulating CO2, but he is not allowed to elevate his views above the requirements of the law. This is an important hearing, and I look forward to learning more from our witnesses. And, but before we proceed with hearing the witnesses, I want to recognize Mr. Issa, who is sitting in for Tom Davis, the ranking member of the committee, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for expressing the majority position extremely well. As we often say here in Washington, we are all, we're all entitled to our opinions, just not our facts. The appropriate role of the President was established in the Constitution and has been revisited on numerous occasions by all three branches of government. Presidents of both parties have assist <coughs> asserted the right to oversee and direct the actions and decisions of regulatory agencies. President Clinton offered a prime example of an aggressive executive who was constantly involved in directing regulatory actions. Indeed, the executive order that gave rise to today's hearing was issued by President Clinton in 1997. <clears throat> I say this to remind the Chairman that the goal of this hearing is to investigate whether or not the President provided his opinions to EPA Administrator Stephen Johnson. On the issue of National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs, for ozone, it is pretty open and shut. He did. The President makes no uh, pretense that he did not, as might have been implied by the other opening statement. We knew that on March 12, 2008, a memo sent from Susan Dudley informing Administrator Johnson of, pre of the President's judgment on the secondary NAC NACs standard. That memorandum is part of EPA's public docket on the ruling and has been available to staff since the, in, the in, initiation of the ozone investigation. In fact, the smoking gun is on the website. Moreover, the President's involvement in the ozone NACs uh, discussion does not reflect any unusual or improper action. His involvement was pursuant to a process established by the Clinton executive order. That order openly declares the President's role in, role in major rulemakings, namely that the President will resolve disagreements between an agency and the Office of Management and uh, Budget's Office of Information Regulatory Affairs, or OIRA. Accordingly, according to the record, the President himself accepted OIRA's conclusions. Therefore, pres <coughs> the, President's, uh, the President carried out his constitutional responsibility consistent with, with the precedent and applicable executive order and the Clean Air Act. 
I would like to also remind members of this committee that a different over, uh, excuse me, a difference over policy outcomes does not necessarily make a policy overcome, or see, outcome fatally flawed, meaning that in fact we can disagree, but at the end of the day, law is, is discretionary in this case, and when followed, as it was by the President or any President, we may, we may choose among, he may choose among a variety of policy options. It should not be surprising that the policy opinion chosen by a president of one party differs from the policy opinion that a member of Congress from another party would have chosen. Nor should it be a reason to cast blameless aspersions or discredit uh, the deliberative process used to arrive at that decision. From the beginning, EPA had proposed the option of either setting a secondary standard equal to the primary standard or alternately adopting a more biologically relevant standard, the so-called W126 standard of 21 parts per million per hour. Given the legitimate role of the President in this decision and the legitimate choices before him, it appears this kind of oversight simply seeks to bully the President into making a decision supported by some members of the Congress. This is raw politics, as the, uh, <clears throat> the majority supposes that the unwelcome decision is an unlawful one. The President concluded within his dis discretion the ozone standard should be set at .075 because of the uncertainty of any benefit at a lower level. Democrats can have a different judgment about the uncertainties and their benefits. But that does not make the President's decision improper in any way. If some Democrats want a stricter ozone standard, they could pass legislation to impose one. They have not done this and do not appear to be ready to do so, at least in part because some members of their party disagree. Finally, with respect to the proper role of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Board, the pl in plain language, the Clean Air Act expressly states that CASAC is advisory, not a standard setting panel and not a policy making panel. Under no circumstances does the Clean Air Act require the administrator to simply rubber stamp CASAC's findings. The advisory committee is dedicated to, uh, directed to review the science and make recommendations to the administrator. By definition, recommendations can be rejected. With respect to the ozone NACS standard in particular, there is no bright line in the science today, regardless of those who would like to seek one, that shows that above a level ozone is unhealthy and below a level it is somehow of no danger. Accordingly, setting the NACS level for ozone is necessarily a policy judgment entrusted to the administrator and claiming, excuse me, claiming that science dictates a certain outcome is contrary to both science and law. It is worth noting that the EPA has spent over 3,200 staff hours in producing over 65,000 pages of documents in their effort to comply with the Committee's demands. OIRA has been similarly responsive, turning over somewhere between 6,800 and 7,900 document pages. And <clears throat> And particularly, uh, excuse, and participated in half a dozen in-person meetings and conference calls in support of accommodating this committee's needs. Throughout the process, the majority has praised the EPA in their efforts to accommodate the committee's demanding production schedule and acknowledged the logistical difficulties involved in such a voluminous document production. Finally. I understand the committee has recently released a memorandum summarizing the majority's findings with respect to both ozone investigation as well as the California waiver investigation. The minority has also drafted a separate memorandum based on our own independent evaluation of the facts. I ask that the minority documents be inserted in the record at this time. Uh, without objection, all the memoranda uh, provided by the majority and minority staff will be made part of the record. Thank you very much, Chairman. I look forward to this 
fact-finding uh, uh, hearing. I believe it is appropriate to ask when there are differences in opinions, because I believe Congress has an oversight role. But as I said in my opening statement, it is very clear the President was within his discretion in this case, based on the facts presently available. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Issa. We are pleased to welcome three uh, participants in our panel. We will hear from Stephen Johnson, who has served as the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency since May 2005. He has been working at EPA in different capacities for the past 27 years. Uh, Susan Dudley was appointed as Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the White House's Office of Management and Budget uh, since April 2007. Prior to her, her current position, Ms. Dudley worked at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and as a consultant at Economist Incorporated. Dr. Rogine Henderson is currently the chair of EPA's Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee and is a senior scientist emeritus at the Lovelace Respiratory Research Institute. She is an expert on air quality and has had a distinguished career serving on multiple boards and committees related to the topic. And I would like to extend a special thank you to uh, Dr. Henderson for the accommodations she has made to make herself available for this hearing. Thank you very much. This hearing has been post postponed twice, and each time Dr. Hed Henderson rescheduled her flight and canceled her plans to make sure she was available. I believe she even canceled the vacation, which I am sorry to hear about. But thank you very much for being here. It is the policy of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath. So if the three of you would please stand and raise your hand, I would appreciate it. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, well, all three of you, your prepared statements that you have submitted to us in advance will be made part of the record. We would like to call on you for your oral presentation. We usually like to keep that within around five minutes, if uh, possible. We will have a clock uh, running. It will be green, and then the last minute will be yellow, and then when the time has expired, it will be red. I will not cut off any of you from your presentation, but if you are mindful that the time has expired, we would like you to. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Keep that in mind and try to summarize. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Waxman and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here to discuss EPA's decision to significantly strengthen the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACS, for ground level ozone. It's also a pleasure to appear alongside Dr. Rogine Henderson, Chair of EPA's Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, or CASAC as it's known. Former EPA Administrator Levitt appointed Dr. Henderson to this position in 2004, and in 2006, I invited her to continue serving in this important role. Since 1980, ozone levels have been cut nationwide by more than 20 percent, even while our economy has more than doubled. And as many of the Bush administration's recent rules to reduce air pollution take effect, we expect that trend to continue. While air quality has been improving, so has our scientific knowledge of the relationships be between pollution, public health, and our planet. As we learn more, science and the law require that we make changes. That is what we have done with regard to ozone. This afternoon, I would like to describe my decisions on the ozone standards, first for the primary standard, designed to protect public health, and second for the secondary standard, designed to protect public welfare. Since EPA last updated ozone standards in 1997, more than 1,700 new studies have been published about ozone's effects on human health. Many of these studies strengthen the linkages between ozone exposure and effects such as reduced lung function or aggravated asthma. And a large number of new studies showed that ozone is both more damaging and harmful at lower concentrations than scientists understood during the last review. After evaluating the results of these studies, along with recommendations of staff, my Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, and public comments, I concluded that the 1997 standard no longer met the Clean Air Act requirement to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. To provide that protection at a level that is requisite to protect public health, I selected a level of 0.075 parts per million 
for the primary standard as the most stringent eight-hour standard for ozone in our nation's history, it will provide significant public health benefits to millions of Americans. Advances in science also provided significant new evidence about ozone's impact on the environment, particularly on sensitive plants and trees. When I proposed the standards last June, I presented two options. One, setting the standard identical to the primary, as been, has been the practice for many years. Or two, setting a three-month standard to address the cumulative effects of plants' exposure to ozone over the growing season. Each of these alternatives had strengths and also had weaknesses. Selecting a secondary standard was difficult, as the record of this rulemaking shows. In making the decision, I reviewed the 1997 NAAQS decision and the scientific evidence available since then. I considered recommendations from KSAC and my staff. I read comments from the public. And as a matter of good government, and as required by Executive Order 12866, I coordinated with others in the executive branch about the two options before me. I weighed all of this information in making my final decision, which was to set the standard identical to the primary standard at 0.075 parts per million. This stronger standard will provide significantly increased protection for plants and trees. In my three years as administrator, I have strengthened two air quality standards, one for particulate matter and one for ozone. And earlier this month, I proposed to strengthen our nation's air quality standards for lead. This is for the first time in 30 years. In the process of navigating the requirements of the Clean Air Act, I have come to see both strengths and limitations of this law. And I believe the need to change it for the better. I believe it is time to modernize the Clean Air Act to improve public health. When I announced the revised ozone standards March the 12th, I also announced four principles upon which the administration will seek proposals to modernize the Clean Air Act. Congress has adopted these principles in other environmental statutes, such as the Safe Drinking Water Act. The Clean Water Act is an important act for us to review. The Clean Air Act is not a relic to be displayed in the Smithsonian, but a living document that must be refurbished to continue realizing results. I look forward to working with you in our efforts to improve this important law and to continue our progress toward clean air across the nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Dudley? Chairman Waxman. Chairman Waxman, um, Ranking Member Issa, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to giving me the opportunity to testify today regarding the role of the Executive Office of the President in EPA's ozone NACS rulemaking. In the interest of public transparency, both OMB and EPA placed in the correspondence related to this rulemaking in the public record to ensure a clear presentation of the issues involved. Pursuant to Executive Order 12866, issued in 1993 by President Clinton. OIRA oversees the regulatory process for the executive branch by coordinating interagency review of significant regulatory actions. In most cases, OIRA is able to work with the regulatory agency to resolve any issues that arise during the interagency review process. For those rare circumstances when such resolution is not possible, the executive order provides a process for conflict resolution by the President with the assistance of the Chief of Staff. EPA's ozone NAAQS is a significant regulation under EO 12866 and as such was submitted to OIRA on February 22, 2008. In the course of interagency review, concerns were raised with a secondary, the welfare-based standard. These concerns focused on the form of the standard, not the level. EPA's proposed rule had sought comment on two alternative forms. Both were scientifically and legally valid. One set equal to the primary standard and another based on measured ozone levels over a season. The draft final rule would have relied on the seasonal form of the secondary standard. Establishing a separate seasonal standard would have deviated from EPA's past practice, which has been to set the secondary ozone NACs equal to the primary NACs. The draft initially submitted for review did not clearly support a conclusion that a separate secondary standard was requisite to protect the public welfare. 
First, as EPA observed in the preamble to the 2007 proposed rule, a secondary standard set at a level identical to the proposed new primary standard would provide a significant degree of additional protection for vegetation as compared to the current standard established in 1997. Second, EPA's analysis indicated that the draft secondary standard accumulated over a season would not be more protective of vegetation than one set equal to the primary public health-based standard. On the contrary, EPA recognized the, recognized the seasonal standard in the final draft was generally less stringent than the primary standard. Given the public interest in this regulatory proceeding, I wanted to ensure that these concerns were laid out clearly to avoid misunderstandings. So I conveyed them to Administrator Johnson in a memorandum dated March 6th. On March 7th, EPA Deputy Administrator Peacock responded in writing. Then, pursuant to the appeals procedure of the executive order, EPA sought further consideration of this disagreement regarding the form of the secondary standard. Following the established presidential review process, the President concluded that, consistent with administration policy, added protection should be afforded to the public welfare by strengthening the secondary ozone standard and setting it equal to the new primary standard. On March 12th, I sent a memorandum to Administrator Johnson memorializing this process. As the preamble to the final rule states, while the Administrator fully considered the President's views, the Administrator's decision and the reasons for it are based on and supported by the record in this rulemaking. So in summary, let me reiterate three key points. First, in the course of interagency review of EPA's final ozone NACs, both OMB and EPA have been forthright in making key correspondence regarding initial disagreements over the form of the secondary standard available to the public. Second, the focus of my correspondence with EPA was not the primary health-based standard, but the secondary welfare-based standard. No changes were made to the level or form of the health-based standard. And third, discussions regarding the secondary standard related exclusively to the form of the secondary standard and did not affect the level of protection from ozone exposure provided to vegetation. Contrary to some media accounts, the eight-hour form ultimately selected by the EPA Administrator is not lower or less protective than the alternative seasonal form of the standard. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Dudley. Uh, Dr. Henderson? Thank you for <coughs> There's a, a button on the base of the mic. Be sure to push that in. Okay. There Good. we go. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to testify before this committee. I am testifying as the current chair of the U.S. EPA's Clean Air Science Advisory Committee, or CASAC, which is a congressionally mandated committee that advises and makes recommendations to the EPA Administrator concerning the scientific basis for setting air quality standards. The CASAC ozone panel included 25 members, all of whom were carefully vetted for their scientific qualifications and for any potential conflicts of interest. The questions addressed by the ozone panel were the same as for any criteria pollutant. In light of newly available information, are the existing standards adequate to protect public health with a margin of safety in terms of the primary standard? are to protect public welfare in terms of the secondary standard. The ozone panel met with EPA staff in public meetings seven times to review eight documents over a two-year period. Public comments were solicited at each of our meetings. Highly productive discussions were held between EPA staff, the public, and CASAC in our efforts to develop the best scientific advice to provide the administrator. A major product of these extended discussions was the unanimous recommendation that the primary standard should be lowered from a level of 84 parts per billion to a level between 60 and 70 parts per billion. Note that the recommendation was in terms of a range. There is enough uncertainty at this lower concentration of ozone that CASAC can only recommend a range of values they consider to be protective of public health. It is a policy decision for the administrator to determine where within that range to set the standard. Our scientific advice was not accepted. The primary standard was lowered, but only to 75 parts per billion. The CASAC panel does not 
endorse the new primary standard as being sufficiently protective of public health with a margin of safety as explicitly required by the Clean Air Act. Moving on to the secondary standard, which includes pr protecting our ecology, the panel was in unanimous agreement that we now have enough information to be able to set a cumulative seasonal secondary standard rather than having to default to using the primary standard. It is both common sense and fully justified scientifically to set a secondary st standard separate from the primary standard since unlike humans, vegetation is affected by cumulative exposures to ozone during the growing season and during daylight hours. It is also in agreement with the National Research Council's 204 re uh, 2004 report in, on managing air quality in the United States, in which they state they strongly recommend that the EPA move away from having separate, having identical primary and secondary standards to setting uh, a, a reasonable secondary standard because there is growing evidence that some vegetation is more sensitive to pollutants than, uh, uh, than are humans. Nevertheless, in March, Ms. Dudley of the OMB sent a memo to Administrator Johnson saying the form of the secondary standard should not be changed. This mem memo was clearly refuted in a knowledgeable, well-written reply from Deputy Administrator Marcus Peacock. In reply, Ms. Dudley stated that President Bush had decided against having a secondary standard that was different from a primary standard. In defense of this decision, the White House said the decision was based fo on following the law. But there is no law against having a, a different secondary standard, as evidenced by the precedent set in 1971 when separate secondary standards were set for both particulate matter and sulfur oxides. Equally perplexing is the fact that the OMB objections were to the proposed form of the secondary standard, which is a scientific matter and not to the level of the proposed standard, which is, includes policy decisions. CASAC has been accused of wandering from scientific issues into policy. In this case, policymakers wandered into scientific issues, and they did not do it well. Willful ignorance triumphed over sound science. Certainly, the administrator is the one who decides what standard to set, and CASAC's role is only advisory in nature. However, if the administrator sets the standard outside the range recommended by his science advisory committee, a strong reason for doing so should be given. The administrator has said his decision was based on his own judgment. Congress may want to ask, on whose advice is the administrator basing his judgments? The Clean Air Act mandates that one source be the CASAC, whose work is done transparently in public by vetted members. By contrast, the advice that appears to be trumping the CASAC advice is not transparent. The OMB and the White House set the secondary standard in effect rather than the EPA administrator. In closing, I would like to quote uh, f from uh, Dr. Paul Gilman, who is the former Assistant Administrator for Research and, and the Science Advisor for the EPA. EPA. Uh, in a statement he made before a recent hearing of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, quote, our best insurance that the science, the scientific judgment, and policy making are as good as they can be is that the process is transparent, participatory, peer-reviewed, and followed with informed oversight. Setting the standards by fiat behind closed doors is not in our best interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henderson. We'll now uh, proceed to, the, uh, to questions, and by agreement with the uh, minority, we will have uh, 12 minutes on each side to begin, for, uh, 12 controlled by the chairman and 12 controlled by Mr. Issa, and then we'll proceed to the five-minute rule. And without objection, that will be the order. The, um, let me start off, Mr. Administrator Johnson. Uh, my concern is that the decisions at EPA are not, are not being based on the science 
and they're not being based on the law. They're being made at the White House and they're being made for political reasons. And my concern is that this is happening over and over again. It appears, appears to be what happened on the ozone rule. It appears to be what happened when you rejected California's efforts to regulate carbon dioxide from vehicles. And it appears to be what happened when EPA tried to regulate carbon dioxide itself after the Supreme Court decision. Dr. Henderson, let me start with you. You're the, the chair of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee and you closely reviewed the new ozone standards that were recently announced by EPA. Are the standards that Administrator Johnson set uh, consistent with the science? It is not consistent with the uh KSAC's recommendations, which are, are based on science. Well, uh, did KSAC give a range so that there was some discretion left that you thought uh, would fit with the science that you knew? Yes, the KSAC uh, uh, always recommends a range, never a bright line. We, we know that there is uncertainty at these low levels of ozone. So uh, with careful consideration of the uncertainties, and what we know from the scientific work that has been done since the last uh, ozone standard was set, we recommend a range within which the administrator could set a level that would be protective of public health with a margin of safety. And did the administrator select within the range recommended by his no, scientific advisory? Okay. No, he did not. Now, uh, in essence, you're saying that Administrator Johnson did not follow the science. Is that, is that That's correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, uh, Administrator Johnson, I want to give you a chance to respond. Dr. Henderson says you didn't follow the science. Do you agree with that? Well, I would respectfully disagree with that characterization. Uh, one is that uh, I did agree with uh, our KSAC that the current standard was not requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. Uh, hence, we were in agreement together. I should note that not all comments agreed with that conclusion. Uh, second is, is that not only do I have the advice, and I appreciate and certainly respect the advice of KSAC and Dr. Henderson's role as, as uh, the chair, um, but also I have a responsibility to listen to what my staff say and, of course, evaluate all of the public comments. After and all doing, the comments and that all, you... And, all, and after all the comments are, are in, and I made the decision uh, based upon all of the science before me uh, that uh, point zero seven five was requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. Now, I let me excuse me. You answered my question. You yes, think you an, you think you set it within the within the protection of the science? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Now uh, the record shows your views about the science and the law were constantly being reversed by the White House. Your professional views may well be scientifically and legally correct, but they're not the ones that are prevailing. You recommended to the White House that the secondary standard for ozone, the one that protects the environment, be set based on cumulative seasonal exposure. Isn't that right? Well, uh, more accurately, Mr. Chairman, would be is that there were two uh, options. There was one that uh, the agency preferred uh, as part of the deliberation, uh, and it was clear that the, there was others in the administration who felt the other uh, was a preferred option. And, of course, uh, as I believe good government, uh, we went through the process as, uh, as outlined by President Clinton's executive order uh, and the President uh, provided input. Ultimately, I made the decision and made the decision to set a secondary standard that is the most protective secondary standard in our nation's history. You as the head of EPA recommended a uh, proposal. OMB and the White House looked at that proposal and said to you, we don't want that proposal. And then you made the decision that they recommended. When you sent your draft final rule to the White House in February, uh, it said that the evidence for a, a season, seasonal standard was compelling and that a seasonal standard was necessary to ensure the requisite degree of protection. But the White House then objected to that proposal and you changed it. Is that, is that what happened? Well, I think uh, uh, more accurately was is that uh, certainly agreed with KSAC that a cumulative seasonal metric is the most biologically relevant form for vegetation. However, at the time, we certainly noticed I really want a direct answer to the question. You submitted a rule to the White House and the White House said they wanted a different rule and then you, you decided what the White House suggested to you. 
Well, there was a difference of opinion between two options. Uh, no, no, yes or options. no. Yes or no. Well, it's not, I don't believe it's a yes or no question. Well, sir. you gave them one option and they gave you the other and the one you accepted was we theirs. Had, we had two options on the table. There was one that was preferred by EPA, one that was preferred by OMB uh, and perhaps others. Uh, and it went through an executive order okay. process. I think that's good government. Well, this is not a minor change. It was a major reversal that I believe was not supported by the record. Your own staff said it was pure politics and that they had never seen anything like it in 30 years of working on air quality standards. An agency law lawyer worried that, worried that the final decision was not even nominally defensible. And this wasn't the only time you've been reversed by the White House. It seems to be happening over and over again. Your deputy associate director, your, your deputy associate administrator, Jason Burnett, told the committee that last fall you supported granting California's petition to regulate carbon dioxide emissions from vehicles. According to Mr. Burnett, you changed your position after you talked with the White House. Is that accurate? I don't believe that that's a fair characterization, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, certainly as you look through the thousands and thousands of pages, including uh, his, uh, his deposition, it shows uh, a very deliberate process going through where I evaluated all options from, from moving from a, uh, a full approval to a denial and options in between. And you and recommended an option be in between. You didn't, yeah. act, you didn't agree that there should be a complete granting of what California wanted, which was a waiver to do exactly what they wanted. You wanted a, a partial waiver so that it would go into effect for a period of time. And uh, that was sent to the White House. Mr. Burnett told us under oath uh, that he thought a partial grant, he meaning you, thought that a partial grant of the California was the best course of action. Well, that's what happened in this instance. The same thing happened a third time. According to your staff, you decided last fall that EPA should issue its own greenhouse, greenhouse gas rules, and you submitted a proposed endangerment finding to the White House. You also circulated a proposal to other agencies to regulate tailpipe emissions of carbon dioxide. Is that accurate? Uh, it is true that we have a, had a draft uh, endangerment finding that was uh, part of the rulemaking process before the Energy Independence and Security Act was passed. And you also recommended that, uh, that uh, uh, other agencies regulate tailpipe emissions of carbon dioxide. Well, that was uh, part of a draft decision that had not gone through interagency process. Okay. But you recommended the Department of Transportation. Well, again, it was uh, it's they hadn't so reviewed deliberative it. and they okay. had not reviewed it. And again, it was before the Energy Independence and Security Act, which then changed the course of action for EPA, and well, that is writing a regulation for renewable fuel standard. We interviewed. And, and, excuse me, and just working with Department, as required, working with Department of Transportation sure. as they updated CAFE. Well, we interviewed seven senior career of EPA officials earlier this year, and they all told us the same thing. You supported federal regulations for carbon dioxide emissions and submitted an endangerment finding to the White House. They said the proposal was sent to the White House in the first or second week of December. They told us that after you submitted your recommendations to the White House, they were told to stop all work on the regulations. This policy reversal became official in March when you announced that EPA was going to start the regulatory process all over again. My concern, Administrator Johnson, is that you become essentially a figurehead. Three times in the last six months, you recommended to the White House that EPA take steps to address climate change and protect the environment. In each case, your positions were taken, uh, your positions were right on the science and the law, yet in each case, you backed down. You received your instructions from the White House. Now, that's not how our government is supposed to work. Congress passes the laws, and the executive branch is supposed to faithfully administer them. But when we see what we see happening at EPA is that when you try to follow the law and the science, you're overridden. The attitude in the White House seems to be that President Bush can ignore the environmental laws that Congress wrote and do whatever he pleases. Now, my questions are uh, about the process and the results. Let's go to this um, ozone decision. EPA is required under the law to set an ozone standard to protect public health and a secondary ozone standard to protect crops, forests, and other aspects of uh, public welfare. And we just went over that very briefly. After years of scientific review, you sent the draft final ozone standard to the White House for review. 
to protect the environment. Your draft recommended the EPA establish a new standard, one that would protect plants from cumulative exposure over growing season. The document to the White House stated that you found the evidence for the new standard to be compelling and necessary. You also wrote that you found no evidence to support the alternative standard favored by industry. But when the final rule was issued on March 12th, you made a complete reversal on the environmental standard, you abandoned the seasonal approach, and you adopted the short-term approach that industry favored. These changes were made at the last minute pursuant to instructions from the White House. According to the record, they were personally directed by the President. Uh, Administrator Johnson, your statement that there was compelling evidence in support of the seasonal standard was dropped from the final rule. So was your statement that there was no biological evidence supporting the industry standard. Why were these statements deleted from the rule? Well, Mr. Chairman, as, uh, as we prepared uh, for making a decision, as I prepared making a decision on the secondary standard, again, we proposed two options. And I think the important point to note is it was not an issue of level of protectiveness. Either form provided additional level of protectiveness for public welfare. Did the White House provide you with new scientific evidence to change your mind? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, certainly during the, uh, the review as part of the executive order, uh, OMB uh, uh, certainly issued a concern. And in fact, I quote, the draft is not adequate to support Dutch, such a decision, end quote. Uh, and as uh, I evaluated their comments, and certainly the, the President's, uh, President's comment, uh, and reviewed it, I made the decision to establish the secondary standard. Uh, I understand you made that decision, standard. but the Clean Air Act is clear in setting ozone standards. The agency is required to use the best science and set a standard that protects health and environment. Did the White House do this? Did the administration listen to the scientists or did they reject the science and set standards that will not protect health and the environment? No, again, as I said, both, uh, both forms were protective of the environment. The question is, what's the form? It's not the standard. Uh, and in fact, uh, for the secondary standard, some of the issues that, uh, that I was facing in terms of uncertainty with adopting a separate standard, a cumulative three months so-called W126 form, was, for example, crop yield data was derived largely from data generated 20 years ago. Um, in addition, the degree of risk attributable to varying levels of ozone exposure there were uncertainties, degree of protection that any specific cumulative seasonal standard would produce, and associated potential for error in determining the standard and what would be providing a requisite degree of protection. All of those were among the uncertainties that certainly, as, uh, as I factored into my decision, uh, played a role, and that's why I chose the primary form with input. Uh, in this case from the President. And I'm very proud of the process. It's been a very transparent process where Susan's memo, Marcus's memo, and in fact the letter uh, citing what the President's input to me at the final decision. I think that's good government and I think that's the way we ought to, we ought to operate. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Issa? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll continue where the Chairman left off because I think it's a, it's a good line of questioning. Uh, Administrator Johnson, you, uh, if I understand correctly, you're a career professional, is that right? That's correct. When did you join the EPA? 1980. 1980? Well, actually, 19, well, I came to EPA, left, and then came back, so, but my service computation date is 1980. Longer than some of the staff behind me have been alive. So we'll, <laughs> we'll say you've been there a long time, and you're not a political appointee. I mean, even though you sit now in an appointed position, you're a career professional, is that right? I'm a career prof professional who also is a political appointee, and I'm proud of both of those mantles. But you were selected because of your long tenure with the EPA. I, I believe the president, uh, in fact, was said that uh, he wanted the most experienced, best person for the job, and I'm honored to be serving our nation and the president in that capacity. Well, let's run through a little of that experience. Uh, first of all, I assume you were at the EPA when, pres when California asked for a waiver from the uh, uh, the need for MTBE or uh, other oxygenates and to try to use things that wouldn't destroy our water or weren't corrosive. Is, do you remember that? Uh, I do remember that, yes, sir. Do you sir. remember that that was denied by the Clinton administration? I do. So when it came to California meeting its own high clean air standards and not being at the back of, uh, of the ethanol lobby, uh, 
the administration under President Clinton was not willing to, to grant that waiver, right? Well, I, I must say that that is tangential because I was not uh, in the Air Office or, or uh, working on air issues, but I am aware of that, uh, that fact. And California's request for a waiver was they were going to comply with all of the standards. They simply weren't going to use things that poisoned our water or required that uh, corn farmers in the Midwest get a special benefit. So the strange thing is, you know, today we are asking about a reduction, and I want to go into that. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out what good what good deed can possibly go unpunished. Let me run you through that. You were also there in, uh, and I apologize. I said 1997. It was a typo. The executive order of President Clinton's was at the beginning of his administration in 1993. Isn't that true? That's correct. And didn't he essentially assign that to Vice President Al Gore as sort of the go-to on air quality? If you remember, I, I don't remember, sir. I don't forget on that one. <laughs> uh, but, but I think that is certainly within administrators' right. In this case, President Bush has, has kept that to himself. But in 1993, if I understand correctly, the ozone level was 1 or one point or 120 parts, where today it is going to be 75. That was the, the air quality prior to the 1997 ruling. Is that right? Yes. And so in 1997, it was reduced from 120 to 84. Since 1997, when it was reduced to 0 .084, has Mr. Waxman's district ever been in compliance? Does Hollywood or L.A. meet that 0 .084? Uh, no, sir, not. Okay. So we have had a standard and many parts of California have never reached that standard. Many parts of America have never reached that standard. Is that correct? Uh, there are a number of parts of America that have not. That is correct. Okay. And doesn't it make the science a little inexact to figure out where the safety level is if, in fact, people are above the existing standard and you are going to lower it even further? Isn't that one of the variables you have to deal with? Well, the law actually prohibits me from considering costs or considering whether or not the standard is actually able to be implemented. And, of course, that is one of the reasons why, among a number of reasons why, that I think that it is worthy of congressional debate. I believe there is an opportunity to improve the Clean Air Act. I think that it is unconscionable that we have a standard that is we have gone through years of scientific evaluation to say this is protective of public health and then communities not even being in compliance with that for 20 or plus years. I think it is worthy of congressional debate and uh, I believe that there are other approaches that could achieve public health protection sooner. So particularly when it comes to CO2, if I understand your recommendation, it is time for Congress to act to create a more responsive law that would allow for compliance, offsets, uh, things to deal, to be honest with, uh, as the Chairman and myself as Californians, the fact that we have some containment areas that just simply never comply. Well, uh, sir, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. My experience in 27 years with a very complex statute as the Clean Air Act is dealing with a global air pollutant with many, many, many issues. My experience says that a legislative fix is the more efficient and effective way because my experience says with these complex laws subject to years and years of litigation and I believe that global climate change needs to be addressed. I believe that greenhouse gas emissions need to be addressed and I think the most efficient and effective way is through a legislative fix. Having said that, I am initiating the rulemaking process by issuing an advance notice of proposed rulemaking uh, later this spring. Well, I appreciate that. Just to finish on my numbers game here a little bit, uh, you, you mentioned your opening statement we are down about 20 percent uh, over several decades, most of your career. But if I, if I do the numbers, coming from 120 parts to uh, 84 parts, uh, it was about 33 percent reduction. So if we're down 20 percent, we obviously didn't hit, we didn't go from the 120 to the 84. Now, if I understand correctly, going to 0.75 is about an 11 percent reduction, and going to 0.70 would be about a 16 percent. So today we appear to be having a hearing about whether a reduction of 11 percent is somehow anti-people's uh, uh, breathing versus uh, a reduction of 16 percent would somehow make it okay. Is, is that pretty much what I should be understanding today? Well, that's, uh, that's certainly uh, a view. Again, uh, ultimately when I made the decision on both the primary and the secondary, but with regard to the primary public health, I determined that, that, that the existing standard was not protective. It was not requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety and wholeheartedly agreed with KSAC that it needed to be reduced. Uh, and I made the decision to reduce it 
uh, and to make it more health protective. And in fact, again, this is the nation's most health protective eight hours uh, ozone standard in the history of the nation. Uh, and that shouldn't go unnoticed. I appreciate that and I agree. And, and if I understand correctly, though, basically if two, three, four years from now, after we have achieved a portion of this 11 percent reduction that is presently uh, being ordered, uh, there is nothing that stops this process uh, with Dr. Henderson's help and so on from seeing that there is an even lower level uh, bolstering the science and ordering a lower level. There is nothing whatsoever stopping it from happening in, at any time. Is that well, right? Well, it is not only not stopping it, but we are actually directed by law and as part of the 77 amendments to the Clean Air Act, we are required every five years to review each and every one of these standards. And of course, one of the challenges for the agency since that uh, amendment in 1977, the agency has never uh, met the five-year requirement. And of course, that is why we're, we believe that there are changes and improvements in the way we actually go through the NAAQS process to preserve science as well as to improve the timeliness of what we are doing. So we are required to, to make these uh, evaluations and keep up with what the, what the current state of the science is. I appreciate it. I would like to yield for a few minutes to Mr. Bilbray as he needs it. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, I don't come from a business background and I don't come as a lawyer. I come from the regulatory background. I served on Air Resources Board in California, served in the Air District, San Diego, one of the few, in fact, the only Air District I know in California that's actually had its standards dropped recently. Um, I mean, its, its category dropped because we, we were so successful. And you talked about since um, 1980 a 20 percent reduction in emissions. Um, just in California during that time with 20 percent reduction, I think our California numbers will be less, I mean more of a drop. We have had a 50 percent increase in population. You know, and that is one thing I hope that when we talk about, about the threat to the public health, we think about the fact that sheer population has been ignored from the um, entire environmental impact of those sheer numbers and that that has to be considered. Doctor, you serve on one of the most critical bodies when it comes to environmental strategies. And I was very happy to work with our scientific body at ARB. Um, California's program has been very successful because of the use of science. Back in the 90s, when California petitioned a waiver from the oxygen mandate, the mandate that we put ethanol or MTBE into our gasoline, was your committee review that mandate and that request? No, because we're an air committee, so we did not. Uh, well, this was an air committee. This, this was this coming was from an the airport. This was coming from the Air Resources Board. I went. I became chair of this committee uh, back in uh, 2004, so it had, it did not occur during my chairmanship. Okay, let me just tell you something. By '94, California had recognized, and our scientists had recognized, <coughs> that ethanol and methanol in our gasoline was not only not beneficial, but was an environmental detriment not just for water, but air pollution. Yes. And we formally requested this in 94. Um, I, for one, authored the bill that every Californian except one signed on to, to allow us to burn a cleaner, cheaper fuel for California. But we were blocked. Mr. Johnson, what was the rationale of the Clinton administration for blocking the request for a waiver for cleaner, fuel for the consumers of California and for the environment of California, what was their justification requiring us to put MTBE in our fuel and um, ethanol in our fuel when the best scientists in air pollution that reviewed the process said there was no scientific reason to do it? Well, sir, it was, uh, I'm, I'm with Dr. Rogine. It was actually before my time, but certainly can, uh, I know I have staff and can get back for the record to uh, respond to that. Well, I'll tell you, now that I've, I've, we've got people that are administrators of EPA at that time who's over at California. And, Mr. Chairman, I'm just telling you, I was outraged at that time that the Clinton administration, in my opinion, was bending to political and, uh, uh, pressure that was influenced by contributions at that time. And I think that we ought to recognize that, yes, there's undue influence on administrations. But no one administration has a monopoly there. And I wish that both Republicans and Democrats could have stood up for the environment against the political pressure, not only um, in the White House, but here in the legislative body. And to this day, for us to point fingers at one administration, when we went for almost a decade requesting a waiver based on the environment, and it was denied by Washington 
to the people of the state of California who I think we all admit have done extraordinary things to protect the environment. Thank you very much. Administrator Dudley, uh, continuing on, with, uh, let me ask you a question. Could you explain to the committee why the regulation of carbon dioxide is such a unique pollutant that it requires a new regulatory uh, paradigm and doesn't fit into the old regulatory structures of the Clean Air Act? Um, I, I think that Administrator Johnson mentioned this a bit in his previous remarks, too. Um, CO2 is a global pollutant. It, we're, it doesn't matter where it's emitted. The effects will be felt regardless of whether it's emitted here or in China. Um, it's, in order to get the achieve the reductions that we think we need requires new technologies, so massive incentives for new technologies. So the Clean Air Act, which was most recently updated in 1990, just isn't, was never designed for it and really isn't well suited to it. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Do we have Administrator Johnson also answer, if you don't mind, Chairman, if he has something? Yes, I, I, would just, uh, I would just say that uh, one of the, uh, I think, important reasons for the advance notice of proposed rulemaking is that the Massachusetts versus EPA decision was in the context of automobiles and light trucks. The way the Clean Air Act operates is that that decision and endangerment not only affects that narrow area of mobile sources, but all mobile sources, and in fact, spills over into Title I and all stationary sources as well. And so when I move forward with an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, it's actually expanding and looking at the entire, uh, all sources, potential sources of, of carbon dioxide and gre other greenhouse gases. And I think that it's important for us as an agency to understand all of those issues. And I think it will also help Congress, uh, you, as you debate this very important issue. And as I've said, I, I believe, given my experience, a legislative approach is a, uh, a much better approach than working through the intricacies of the Clean Air Act and with the likely litigation that would ensue. You might prefer another law, but there was a law. There is a law, the Clean Air Act, adopted by Congress in the U.S. Supreme Court said that EPA is supposed to regulate uh, carbon emissions under that law. Even if you'd like another law, it's, you have to enforce the law that's there. Well, and that's why I'm proceeding with an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which is the first step in the regulatory process. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Henderson, in your written testimony, you addressed the decision to set an environmental standard for ozone that's higher than the standard the scientific experts recommended. And you stated, and I quote, willful ignorance triumphed over sound science. Those are strong words. Uh, would you explain for us? I was referring really to the secondary standard because uh, in this case of the secondary standard, we were really excited that we now have enough information to use a different form for the this secondary standard. In the past, we've had to default to the primary standard because we didn't have the right information. And then to, to get so close to having the form changed, and then at the last minute, with no explanation really of, of why it was done, that form was squelched by, uh, the new form was squelched by the White House uh, because uh, President Bush said we couldn't have a different secondary standard from the primary standard. Now, that is ignorance to me. That's willful ignorance because I do not think the OMB really didn't hadn't read the Clean Air Act to know that that you can set that. And I don't think the the, the OMB really hadn't read our uh, the EPA staff documents that carefully explained why we were focusing on vegetation as the welfare effect of concern. So that's what my willful ignorance meant, and it bothers me with all the hard work that went into this by the EPA staff and by CASAC to develop this different form uh, uh, for a secondary standard that someone can just, for uh, no transparent reason, say, no, nope, can't do that. that. That's what I meant by Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, do you want to respond? Well, um, uh, again, it, it's, uh, the record clearly indicates that this, this was a difficult decision and that these were two both viable options. Again, important piece is that the level of protectiveness was essentially equivalent, whether whether a W126 form or identical to the eight-hour. Well, that's uh, interesting ozone. you should say that because I, what I see is there was no new evidence. At least you couldn't give any in answer to Mr. Waxman. No new evidence from the White House at all on that issue. And before, you had found evidence to be compelling in your own words and necessary in your own words, and in your own words found no evidence to support the alternative. 
uh, standard that was favored by industry. So, Mr. Johnson, you say that the final decision was justified, but looking at your own words, and let's look at some of the words of your own staff, what they had to say about it. We looked through the documents that were provided by EPA as part of the investigation, and it's stunning, stunning to see how EPA staff reacted to the rejection of the seasonal standard recommended by Dr. Henderson. An EPA associate director comment, and I quote, looks like pure politics. An EPA lawyer wrote, and I quote, we could be in a position of having to fend off contempt proceedings. The obligation to promulgate a rule arguably means to promulgate one that is nominally defensible. One EPA manager told his colleagues that he offered his, and I quote, sympathies to all for all the work that went down the drain. And another career official stated, and I quote, I've been working on Knox for over 30 years and have yet to see anything like this. Yet another agency official responded by saying, I know how incredibly frustrated and disgusted we all are at the moment. So, Mr. Johnson, I think what's happening in the EPA is pretty unacceptable. It's the administrator's job to implement our nation's environmental laws and to protect the public health and welfare. Not, you know, it has to be based on the best evidence. And by your own words, the evidence was compelling and it was necessary that the standard be different and a new form be instituted. So it looked to me that by your own words and by your staff's words, you're not doing your job. Recently, the Union of Concerned Scientists released the results of a survey of nearly 1,600 EPA scientists. The survey revealed that EPA scientists faced significant political interference with their work. Nearly 1,000 EPA scientists said they personally experienced at least one incident of political interference during the past five years. Over 500 EPA scientists knew of many or some cases where the EPA political appointees had inappropriately involved themselves in scientific decisions. Mr. Johnson, are you concerned at all that hundreds of EPA scientists are reporting incidences of political interference with their work? Well, sir, I'm uh, proud of the fact that uh, EPA has consistently ranked in the top ten uh, places for uh, federal employment. Are you proud uh, as of a career, the fact that are you career, concerned, as my question was, are you uh, concerned that hundreds of EPA scientists are reporting political interference in their work? Well, I'd like to uh, quote to you, if I may, a quote from Dr. Paul Gilman, who was uh, just recently testified. And let me just uh, give you a quote. Uh, EPA has become too politicized in its actions, too eager to pursue narrow political goals, and too willing to ignore congressional intent. Uh, at least a dozen former EPA officials who played roles in setting policy now work as industry consultants. Or, this is all still quoted, Orlando Sentinel, science is as politicized in America as it was in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, and EPA is a prime example, end quote. He then goes, and I quote, to say, I want to make this point that these headlines all came prior to the current administration and pertain to the previous administration, end quote. So that's just so a, sir, an excellent defense, Mr. Johnson. So, so, sir, so apparently because you think something was politicized in a previous administration, politicizing it in this administration is laudable. No, that's, that's not uh, the question. That's, a, question that's an inappropriate was, conclusion, sir. My question to you was, are you proud of the fact or are you concerned of the fact that hundreds of EPA scientists are reporting political interference with the work now, not in the past administration. We can have a hearing on that some other time. Are you proud of what's going on now? I am very proud of the work of the agency Fine. and all thousands of scientists that we have and include 17,000 uh, okay. employees at EPA. Well, I take uh, some and, Mr. Mr. Uh, and I, I will say just I'll share my experience as a scientist growing up in the agency uh, that there are those times that uh, scientists agree with the ultimate decision. There are times that they don't. Uh, and uh, I understand that. Uh, as my role as administrator is to evaluate the science and evaluate the policy uh, under what the law directs me to do and make the best decision. Uh, and that's what I've been clearly, doing and that's what I can do. Clearly not what happened here, the Mr. Johnson, time has by your own admission. Thank you, Mr. Time Chairman. has expired. Uh, Mr. Belbrick. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have to say, let, let me just follow up on this issue of um, the survey by scientists that there was an undue political influence here. Mr. Johnson, is it fair for me to say that there were 55 requests for comment sent out by uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists? 5,500, uh, 5, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know the numbers of what was done or what wasn't. Uh, I am aware uh, that, in fact, the survey was received by political appointees and non-scientists. So I have no idea what uh, criteria they used for uh, so sending a survey out. That I have is there 5,500 out there, about 15 came in, about 1,500 came in, about, and of that, we're, we're looking at maybe half of them had concerns. 
um, and there might have been. My concern was that for this to be used in this hearing as some kind of scientific document, and I have to, I say any, anybody would let, take a look at this and said it is not a scientific document. It doesn't just, you know, no pollster in the world would accept this, and any elected official accept it as being a standard, I think would be appalled by it. But we'll talk about that with the next panel. Um, doctor, my question to you is, they, um, uh, in your analysis, was there a consider, you know, you talked about the vegetation, the ecosystem. Was there a consideration of economic value considered in, in that standard? KSAC is not allowed to consider economic uh, issues. And what we uh, are asked to do is give advice and recommendations on what will be protective of the well of vegetation and the welfare without regard to, to the uh, costs or the uh, ease of implementation. So what we did consider uh, was what was biologically relevant and and uh, what was recommended by the National Research Council. And also, uh, I have a concern for the effect of ozone on vegetation as well as on people. When you continually emphasize the primary standard, where do you monitor? You monitor where the people are in urban areas. But we are neglecting the rural areas where our food crops and plants are grown. and when you need to have information, well, how does ozone affect those crops and, and uh, how, how protective do we need to be Doctor, for Doctor, how long have you been chairman of this body? This, I'm in my fourth year. I go off in October. Okay. I, I'm, I'm concerned because when I talk about economic value, you went immediately to a defensive based on the cost of implementing strategies. You didn't talk about the economic value of the crops that might have been destroyed. Well, I now you you got to understand you just me. shifted went way <laughs> off of where I was talking about, and I, I got to understand that you know that that economic value is something regulatory agencies do all the time. But certainly, and and there there is a uh, I believe what did they call it a regulatory impact uh, assessment done after our uh, assessment. My question to you then, if you did not make that, what criteria did you use? To set that on the impacts, to set the form, the yeah. form, the form. What was, standards did you use? The form was purely a scientific issue. We, uh, I am not an ecologist, but we have very good ecologists on our panel, and they are the ones who developed the form. Uh, I mentioned Ellis Cowling, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and and others. They know what they're doing, so they developed the form. Okay, I, I'm just concerned that, you know. Ms. Dudley Johnson, this issue of economic values, both in the impact of not doing something, and I'm sorry the doctor went off just worried about enforcement, but also enforcement, isn't there a consideration that you've got of economic value impact um, from both sides? First of all, lack of action and action? Well, again, under the, uh, under the Clean Air Act and under establishing NACs, I'm not allowed to consider uh, costs. Uh, or whether, in fact, it can be implemented or not. And, and so I have to base my decisions uh, based upon what the science says. And, of course, I think it's also important to note uh, that with all science, there are uncertainties. And there's a range of uncertainties. And so then science, policy, and then ultimately judgment uh, needs to be exercised to make uh, an appropriate decision. Well, isn't in the statute the term economic value actually integrated right into the statute? Is there a reference there? I, I have it in front of me. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, it says, Welf welfare includes but is not limited to effects on soils, water, crops, vegetation, man-made materials, animals, wildlife, weather, visibility and climate, damage to and deterioration of property, hazards to transportation, as well as effects on economic values and on personal comfort and well-being. Well, let me just say that I appreciate that that is a consideration we setting standards. I sure wish uh, we would set the same standard before we start putting poison in our fuel, too. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Bilbray. Uh, Mr. Uh, Higgins? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, focus on the primary standard and health impacts. And I think this is really important because it affects lives, health, and the well-being of people across the nation. Uh, there are health risks we have some control over, uh, but unhealthy air affects each and every one of us. Uh, breathing in this life is not an option. 
Ozone is a dangerous pollutant. It hurts our lungs, worsens coughs and asthma, and makes us more vulnerable to colds and flu. When ozone layers are high, more people go to the hospital, more children miss school, and more adults miss work, and more people die. Dr. Henderson, will the standards set by EPA adequately protect Americans from ozone pollution? The KSAC panel does not agree that the uh, standard that was set is sufficiently protective of, of public health, particularly uh, in regard to a margin of safety. Our concern is for particularly asthmatic children whose uh, asthma is aggravated by the higher ozone levels and for what you, you gave So the answer is no. The answer is no. I should be more succinct. No. Administ Administrator Johnson, how do you respond to Dr. Henderson's concerns? Well, I disagree that I set the standard that's requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. That's the statutory requirement and that's what the science, uh, in my judgment, indicates. I think it's also, I mean, as you can read in our, uh, in our final agency decision document, we go in great detail and, in fact, we, uh, I think it's a good idea and we're also required to respond to CASAC's recommendations. There was one study that was a, a pivotal study, a clinical study conducted by uh, Dr. Adams and that at his study he was the only one that had gone and studied at the level of .060, which was at the lower end of the CASAC range. Um, Dr. Adams actually wrote to the agency twice. Uh, questioning the use of his study and saying that we were, we were misusing his study, that there were too many scientific uncertainties at that level. And so that and for other reasons which are documented in our, in our uh, decision document, uh, I uh, disagreed with CASAC on the actual level uh, and agreed, but I did agree, that uh, the current standard was not requisite to protect public health well, and that's me, why I yeah. reduced it from 0 0.084 to 0 0.075. Yeah, I want to address uh, an inconsistency within EPA's own analysis. Uh, and I believe there's a, a major inconsistency here. EPA developed a regulatory impact analysis comparing the standard you chose to the standard recommended by Dr. Henderson. EPA projected that your weaker standard will produce the following results each year between 500 and 3,500 premature deaths, 1,400 non-fatal heart attacks, almost 10,000 asthma attacks or asthma symptoms, 7,500 emergency room and hospital visits, 67,000 lost work days, and almost a million lost school days. Uh, Administrator Johnson, uh, why didn't you listen to your own staff and set a more stringent standard to avoid these harms. Again, the uh, Clean Air Act does not require a primary standard to be set at zero risk. Uh, and to achieve that, what you're referring, would have to be set at a zero, probably zero level. The Clean Air Act does not require that. The, the standard uh, of the law is requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. Uh, and then through court decisions, that standard is neither more or less stringent than necessary. Yeah. And then that is my judgment, and I made the judgment that we needed to, to strengthen the standard, and I strengthened the standard, which is the nation's most health protective eight hour ozone standard in our history, uh, and I'm very proud of that. The public health experts aren't uncertain about the harm from ozone. Uh, the most eminent uh, public health organizations in America agreed that the science advisory committee's recommendations, and this included the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, the American Heart Association, among others. I have a letter from the American Lung Association uh, to this committee strongly critiquing EPA's rule, and I ask unanimous consent to enter it into the record. Without and objection, that will be ordered. The American Lung Association says, quote, if EPA had followed the law, we could have cut the risk of life-threatening pollution to millions of Americans nationwide. Uh, Administrator Johnson, last question. Uh, your decision seems to be inconsistent with the mainstream thinking. It rejects the recommendations of your expert panel, your own staff, the outside public health organizations. It's just not credible to argue that your decision is based on science. 
Well, I disagree with that, and we certainly have uh, an excess of 400 pages of document that goes into great detail describing the science behind my decision and that it is the most health protective uh, uh, standard in our nation's history. Uh, I might add, um, as uh, I met with all the public health officials and uh, met with uh, others uh, so that I could have their input. Uh, and uh, I think that's important as part of the process uh, in me making, making a decision. Um, I, as I mentioned in my oral testimony, I've just uh, proposed a new health protective uh, standard and, uh, for lead. Uh, and I've taken it a step further uh, because uh, CASAC recommended a particular range uh, but as part of the, uh, as part of the, the evaluation, uh, the Centers for Disease Control have said that there is no safe level of lead. So uh, CASAC did not recommend, but I felt it was important as a public health official to ask the question, should we be setting the standard for lead at zero? Mr. Higgins. And so those are the kinds of decisions that I have to make and I seek input and I, again, I appreciate the counsel of CASAC, my staff, the notice and comment, the public hearings, all of which, but ultimately I need to make a tough decision. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Tell us time has expired. Uh, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate you holding this hearing and uh, apologize that a scheduling conflict prevents me from, from remaining, but I would like to yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, you know, uh, if we could put the map up on the board, uh, I think we've got. Uh, uh, Mr. Platts? Oh, which has Todd to stay if for? Mr. A few Platts minutes. is yielding his time. He must stay here. Go ahead. Okay, if you, if you could put the map up on the board, and uh, this will pr primarily concern, uh, I think, most, both Administrator Dudley and Administrator Johnson. But it, uh, if you look at the chart, uh, these are counties with monitor violations in 2008 primary ozone uh, at the 0.75 parts per million and secondary as standard of 0.21. Now, my understanding is that every area that's dark, which includes, unfortunately, most, most of California, uh, there is no effective difference whether you set the standard for secondary higher or lower. Is that correct? That basically the ones that are in compliance will be in compliance at either level. The ones that are not in compliance will not in, be in compliance at either level. Is that roughly true based on the map you see up there, if you're familiar um, with it? Based upon uh, an analysis that our staff did that whether the form was uh, the W126 form or the uh, following uh, identical to the eight-hour ozone standard, uh, based upon the decision that I made to be protective, um, that it, it didn't matter either way. Okay, and following uh, up on that, but clear, excuse me, but yes. sir, clear, but clearly for the primary standard, there were many many counties based upon monitoring data that would be out of compliance with the new the new primary health protective standard. I realize that, and of course, uh, if California is out of compliance uh, in such a large area, they're going to be in either case. Uh, I would note that uh, the food basket of California appears to be producing a tremendous amount of crops for us with already non-compliant ozone layers. Uh, Dr. Henderson, can you, can you explain essentially why productivity has increased dramatically in m most of America, whether it's corn, wheat, rice, uh, or the vegetables grown in California during a time in which ozone uh, levels were far above what you're saying you'd like them to be? Well, it would be a mistake for me to try to calculate all the factors that go into food production. What I was trying to mention was we could do a better job of air quality management in rural areas if we had some kind of handle on what the ozone levels are and if they're at a level that can affect uh, the foliage. Okay, but back to Administrator Johnson. You didn't find that setting a different standard would have made any difference. In other words, the economic value that you're required by statute to, and, and uh, Administrator Dudley, you too, you're required to look at this economic value. If I read this map correctly, there is no economic value to the different standard uh, because it doesn't, in fact, change the compliance. Is that correct? To be, uh, to be very precise, uh, based upon the data sets analyzed between 2003 to 2005 and then 2004 to 2006 from currently monitored counties, no additional counties would have been out of attainment 
under the seasonal secondary standard initially proposed by EPA. Okay. And could we put the chart up that comes next? Uh, the, this is the chart of levels for the 12-hour standard, the so-called uh, W126 standard. Uh, I think uh, all of you are familiar with this. Uh, when I read it, looking at the difference between the 0 .075 and the 0 .070, under the uh, 126 standard, parts, 21 parts per million, I see no change again. Uh, is, that, is that essentially a more graphic way to show uh, that, in fact, there would have been no benefit had we uh, implemented the lower standard, the secondary yes. standard? Yes. Okay. So, Dr. Henderson, uh, if, if I accept uh, science, and I do, and that your conclusions uh, are well intended but without the economic value consideration, would you agree based on no counties changing uh, there's, uh, the 121, 20, 126 that in fact it, it, it was within the administrator's purview to judge that and to come up with a, at least the standard for now of 0.075? I, I'm, I'm mixing whether you're talking about the secondary standard or the primary well, standard. Well, go, I'm going to the secondary standard, but let me put it another way. Your advisory role is for the administrator to accept or reject that, in yes. fact, it's advisory even though it's scientific based, and you have standards different than he does. You said yourself you do not evaluate uh, this economic value where he does. Is that correct? It is certainly within his, his purview. He is the one who decides. We are advisory only. And in this case, in the case of the secondary standard, I think the decider was President Bush. And Thank that you. is within his purview. I mean. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to clear up the difference in scope, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Hodes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the law is very clear that EPA may not consider costs in setting a national air quality standard to protect the environment. The Supreme Court specifically addressed the issue in 2001. The Court wrote that if EPA established a standard by, quote, secretly considering the costs without telling anyone, unquote, it would be grounds for throwing out the standard because the administrator had not followed the law. I'm concerned that this is exactly what happened in this case. The record before this committee shows that the unanimous recommendation of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee was rejected by you, Mr. Johnson, apparently on the basis of White House opinion or desire, uh, to which you apparently acceded, given the change in your position uh, from February 22nd to March 12th, for which there is no explanation that is reasonable other than the, what, what the White House told you to do, and much weaker standards were finally selected. I want to know, Mr. Johnson, during the agency's consultation with the White House, did White House officials express concerns about the costs of implementing the ozone standards? Uh, sir, are you referring to the primary or the secondary standard? Either one. Did they express concerns about the costs of implementing the ozone standards with respect to either primary or secondary? And I will just point out for you that your administrator, Mr. Peacock, uh, said that it is clear that the prohibition extends even to secondary standards. That, uh, that is my belief and that is the way I operated in my decision making. Uh, did the White House express concerns about the costs of implementing either the primary or secondary standards in your consultations with the White House? As I said, um, for, the, for making a decision, it was my decision, my decision alone, made independently, and I cannot consider and did not consider costs, nor whether it was implementable. My Mr. Question, Hose, I don't think he's answered your question. I, I know. I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, here's my question. Not what you considered. I'm asking you, Mr. Johnson, during the consultations you had with the White House, did the White House officials express concerns to you or your agency about the costs of implementing the ozone standards? Well, if I did recall, I'm not sure that it would be appropriate for me to get into what, uh, who said what at what point in time. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe that, uh, that it's important for me and others uh, future uh, administrators to be able to have candid discussions with uh, members of the executive branch 
And uh, as I said, uh, I made the decision. I made the decision okay, without consideration of cost. Sir, let's stop and that's there. That's the important. Let's uh, stop important there piece. because I want to pursue this and I want an answer to my question. When I hear a witness start talking to me about if I did recall, I wonder whether or not the witness is being evasive. Do you recall having discussions with the White House concerning costs of implementing the standards? I have routine conversations with members of the executive branch. So it's a branch. simple yes or no answer. Do it's you recall? It's not a simple yes or no answer because uh, I have routine conversations on a multitude of issues. And I'm saying is that with, uh, on this issue, I made the decision. I understand what the law directs me to do, and that's not to consider costs. And I did not consider costs. Let me go back. Do you recall, sir, search your memory, having conversations with the White House about costs in implementing the standards? If I did recall, it would not be appropriate for me to discuss the nature of those conversations. So you won't tell me whether you do or do not recall? As I said, it was not part of my decision making. Uh, that's not my, sir, th that's the important piece, sir. With all due respect, I'm asking the questions and you're answering them. And I'm answering you don't like the answers. No. What I want to know is do you recall or don't you recall? I said, uh, even if I did recall, it's not appropriate for me to get into the nature of discussions I have within the executive branch. And the basis for your refusal to answer the question, is it your lack of recollection or some assertion of privilege? Uh, I'm not as asserting any privilege at this time. But I think that it's important. I think that it's important that, that I and future administrators have the ability to have candid conversations. Uh, and I also believe that that's important. And certainly, as the agency deliberates on issues that are before us, uh, and I think that that's, a, that's an important uh, privilege. And also, I think that it's an important uh, principle that, uh, that I need to maintain for me and for future administrators. I'll try this one last time. You understand, sir, you're under oath before this committee. Oh, I understand that, sir. Do you or don't you recall having conversations with the White House about whether or not costs were considered by the White House? Uh, as I said, that whether or not I recall or don't recall, I don't believe that it is appropriate for me to discuss the nature of those conversations. I believe it's appropriate for me to be able to have candid conversations. And I also said, under oath, that I did not consider costs in making my decisions. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Your Thank time you, has Chairman. expired. Um, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Dudley, um, I want to give you some equal time here. Uh, I was intrigued by your the memo that came, let me see if I can find it, on March 6th, which was six days before this deadline, um, you sent a memo to EPA uh, where you said, quote, the draft does not provide, this is the draft EPA report, does not provide any evidence that a separate secondary standard would be more protective than one set equal to the draft primary standard. Explain that. The, um, the air quality that would be achieved by setting the, sec the secondary standard based on that seasonal form averaging it over three months or setting it equal to the primary, the level of air quality is the same. And I think that gets, it gets back mm -hmm. to the, the, the maps that were up there. I mean, so if I'm, what we I care guess, about is air quality, yeah. And, and the air quality that vegetation and humans are exposed to, the two standards from all the analysis that EPA did, would have the same effect. Yeah, I'm incredulous that you could claim there wasn't any evidence when uh, in the draft, the original draft, the administrator uh, indicated that he found evidence compelling that ozone-related effects on vegetation are best characterized by an exposure index that is cumulative and seasonal in nature, and that that uh, conclusion on the part of the administrator w was reflective of what the expert panel had concluded and what uh, months, if not years, of research and work on the part of the EPA staff uh, had concluded. So again, I mean, I could see you asserting perhaps that it does not provide adequate evidence or sufficient evidence, but to s suggest that it didn't provide any evidence, that there was no evidence that this secondary standard that was originally being put forward um, 
would be the appropriate one is doesn't doesn't seem to jive with all of the other testimony and documentation that we have. Well, there there are two different issues here. Um, one is that whether vegetation responds over a season rather than over a day. And, the, and EPA did present evidence to that. EPA also presented evidence that current, the current standard or the previous standard may not be protective of vegetation. But at the end of the day, regardless of which form you used, air quality would be reduced so that the same, those, that vegetation would be exposed to the same air quality. That is the bottom line. So that the form of the standard does, will not affect the, the air quality. It won't affect what people have to do to come into compliance with the standard, and it won't affect the air quality in those counties that are affected by the standard. Well, it, what you're saying strikes me as double talk in the context of, of what we heard in the original draft uh, from the administrator, and certainly the reaction of the staff and the experts to the ultimate decision to abandon the more cumulative standard in favor of the same standard as the primary. Uh, was was intense uh, and was lamented at all levels within the staff, which to me suggests that there was sufficient evidence. Uh, certainly, uh, there was evidence that that would be the most appropriate route to take. Um, Administrator Johnson, I just want to say to you that um, I'm offended. And I'm not trying to be facetious here. I, I actually mean this. I'm offended on your behalf by the the White House's handling of this um, <clears throat> matter, because uh, right up to the end, uh, you were going with the science. In fact, I commend you for the fact that after you started to see the writing on the wall on March 6, you nevertheless. And, and then at that point had the ability, I guess, to begin regrouping, you nevertheless pushed forward right up to the point of the deadline uh, when the rug was essentially uh, pulled out from under you or you received this countermand, this final countermand or override uh, from the White House. And I'm going to ask you a question which, again, I don't mean to be facetious. Um, you're somebody who was in the agency for many years. You had this opportunity uh, to uh, take the top spot there. And I'm curious, when you did that, uh, did the President, in speaking with you about taking this job, or the White House, in speaking with you about it, um, did they indicate to you that there would be times uh, when the science would be overridden for political purposes and you would essentially have to carry that water? for the White House? How clear were they about these instances occurring? Sir, my, my charge and certainly my oath of office was to carry out the, the mandates and the laws uh, of, that uh, I am responsible for under the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, that was the charge. Um, the President went further and said, Steve, I want you to accelerate the pace of environmental protection uh, while uh, you help maintain the nation's economic competitiveness. Uh, that was a charge that was given. I have certainly been very public about that. Uh, and uh, I have been carrying out those duties to the, to the best of my ability, looking at sound science. And as I said, uh, science isn't, to, isn't pure. There are many uncertainties in science, requires science, policy judgments. And of course, then there are a variety of other issues that come into play depending upon the statute. Well, with uh, all so due respect, I can't imagine a clearer example of where your charge to carry out the law and respect the science um, to come into conflict with what the President the White House's uh, edict was in this particular matter. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, my understanding is uh, Jason Burnett is a senior uh, member of the EPA. Yes. And he is a trusted and respected advisor. Is that yes. right? Uh, a person on whom you uh, had confidence, have confidence? Yes. Is that correct? But he's, as you know, been deposed. And uh, he testified that, uh, according, to, according to him, in his testimony, you favored granting 
of this uh, California waiver in full in August and September. Uh, is Mr. Burnett correct? Well, I think that uh, he, he uh, is correct in characterizing that over time, uh, as I was briefed. Hey, let's keep it simple. I mean, I understand well, this is a process. What I, my question, I'm really going to try to frame a question that's clear that allows you to answer it as clearly and as succinctly as possible. And I do appreciate that this is a process and you have many things that come in. Mm -hmm. So what happens today isn't necessarily what is the wise decision tomorrow, okay? Uh, but is he correct in his recollection, according to his testimony, that in August and September you were leaning towards a full waiver? Well, I don't recall the August and September time frame, but I can say with confidence that I uh, was considering all options, uh, including a full grant and also a full denial and options in between. And I think his, uh, so Mr. I, his, my recollection is, as I read the transcript last night, I think he also states that as well. Mr. Burnett said it was very clearly that in August and September you were favoring granting a waiver in full. Yeah, we got to move on here. I only have five minutes, so you read it last night. Well, that, that's what he the said. The issue isn't what Mr. Burnett said. As the issue is whether it's accurate or not. Well, as I, as I said, is that uh, I considered each one of the options. All right, let I me don't recall the particular time, Look, that's but obvious. I, I okay. did consider. That's, it's obvious mm -hmm. that you did. Here's what he said. <laughs> I think you've more or less acknowledged in August and September he was correct. You were leaning towards a full waiver. He said that over time you began to think of a partial grant. Is he right there? Uh, I considered a partial grant. That's correct. All right. Then on December 19th, of course, you issued a denial. Yes. And mm -hmm. was that after you had been to the White House to have conversations about this issue? Well, again, I have routine conversations with the White House uh, throughout the uh, throughout the calendar. Did you uh, have again? Any, this was my did this you was have my any, this was my decision. Did you have any? And I, I think I understand. Well, <laughs> Mr. Johnson, you know, we'd appreciate if you answered the questions. Yes, I'm. I'm trying. <laughs> did you Did you have a meeting with the president about the, uh, this? Uh, I have routine meetings with the executive branch, including the president. Okay. What part of my question don't you understand? Did you have a meeting with the president about this issue of the EPA waiver? When and where and if I have meetings with the president uh, are, I said I have routine meetings with uh, members of the executive branch. Uh, those meetings, I believe, is there are in, in confidence. My... Is there... and, and as I said, I made the decision. It was my Mr. decision Johnson, alone. You described this process is the, v transparent and open, correct? Yes. And you're proud of the process? I am. It was, this was an excellent process, as you can see Great. from and the does, thousands of does, pages. Does transparent <laughs> mean that we can't know whether you, in fact, met with the president and discussed with him this issue? I believe that, uh, that uh, as administrator, that I need to have the ability to have private meetings with the president and members of the executive Did branch. Did I just ask you what the content was of your meeting with the president? I said I have already acknowledged that I have routine meetings with the uh, president and members of the executive branch. I think that's good Let me government. Let ask a few things. In your September 12th briefing, there were slides that were presented that included a statement from your staff that the clearest and most defensible option would be to grant the waiver. Is that true? Uh, I don't recall that particular slide. I know that there was a wide range of options and that they were all legally uh, There were defensible. staff evaluations at the September meeting. This is all in the record. I mean, this I said, is I don't remember that particular so we can, document. We can pretend to the people listening that this is an uh, established fact, but let's... Sir, there were, there were uh, how many thousands of pages of documents that, that we submitted briefing, to September 12th briefing, it said California has extraordinary ozone conditions. Greenhouse gas standards are reasonably viewed as necessary to address climate change, and opponents to the waiver have not met their burden of showing the California standards won't benefit climate change and ozone conditions. Are you aware that in these evaluations, they originally contained those remarks in writing until they were removed at the insistence of Mr. Myers? Uh, I don't recall that situation, and I don't necessarily see okay, uh, documents that are uh, drafted by well, at the uh, individual staffs. Well, you, I don't necessarily see all the meeting. workings <laughs> of drafting and redrafting before that reaches my desk. That's the you point. Know, this is sounding like some this of the, the meetings point. you're at, you're present, and some of the meetings you're at, you're not. 
September 20th and 21st first briefing. This is your briefing. I mean, it's not somebody else's. The, did the EPA staff make it clear that the statutory criteria for granting the waiver had been met? That's a threshold question, correct? There were, uh, there were a wide range of options and there were uh, opinions that it's were not, provided to me you know that are part of the record. It's as, a I, little, as I it's said, it's a little frustrating. It, well, it shouldn't be frustrating well, because there's a 50 page document no, describing no. my decision and the scientific basis and what the law requires me to uh, decide, which I decided. Mr. Welch, your time has expired. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you admitted you had a conversation with the President on the California waiver. That wasn't an issue. Now you're refusing to say whether you had a conversation with the President on the ozone waiver. What's the difference? Uh, as I said, I have routine conversations with the President uh, as well as members of the executive branch. And uh, I, you, I you believe did, that those Let me get the record straight. Chairman, we have can it? we have regular order? Uh, the Chairman's pursuing regular order. You said for the record that you had a conversation with the President on the ozone layer? I don't recall. On the ozone that, uh, ruling? I don't recall. Uh, making that comment myself. Do you no. recall making a comment that you've had a conversation with the President on any of these three rules that we've been looking uh, at? As I said, what I do recall, and I, and I believe is an accurate uh, reflection of what I have said, is that I have routine conversations with members of the executive branch, including the President, on a wide range of issues. Okay. I, I'm not going to pursue this because I'll have another opportunity, but it seems to me you're being awfully evasive, and I don't know why you cannot tell this committee whether you in fact had a discussion about this rule or that rule or the other rule. We're only talking about three different rules. Either you did or you didn't. And I don't know why you cannot uh, tell us that information. No one is asking you what was said. We're just asking you whether you had a conversation. And the answer is not acceptable to say, I've had conversations with the President and others on a routine basis and I'm not going to tell you whether I had a conversation on these subjects. What else do you talk to them about? As I said, I have routine conversations on In the wide those range routine of topics, conversations, did you talk about on a wide the ozone range of topics? Topics? Mr. Chairman, I must did insist you, that we go to regular order. The gentleman uh, is n not in order at this time. Mr. Chairman, did we you ha have, we have a conversation? The rules of the, Mr. Chairman, the rules of the House, the the Mr. Will, Mr. Chairman, the the rules of the House cease. call for an alternating the five gentleman minutes. Will cease. On what time does the Chairman the speak? Gentleman will Point cease. of order, Mr. Chairman, on what time does the Chairman speak and ask these questions? The Chair has a prerogative to pursue for the record a clarification. Mr. That Chairman, I'm where in the rules is that stated? Could I see a copy of the, of the rules that allow for this said? The rules of the House, Mr. We Chairman. We will furnish you with a copy of Chairman, there are multiple time. members that could yield you time. I would ask that you. I will have you physically removed from this meeting if you don't stop. I want to know an answer to the question. Did you have a discussion with the President on any one of these three rules? Mr. Chairman, as I said, I have routine conversations with the President and the Executive Branch on all, uh, on many matters before the agency of particular importance. And I don't believe that it is appropriate for me to get into the details of what those conversations are or are not. I think that's an important privilege that uh, an opportunity Are you asserting an executive privilege? Uh, not at this time, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Ms. Watson is now recognized. Thank you. And uh, let me try this. Mr. Johnson, in December of 2007, you announced that EPA would deny California's petition, and I'm a Californian, for a Clean Air Act waiver to enforce its standards to reduce greenhouse gas pollution from cars and trucks. In our previous investigations of the White House's manipulation of climate change science, we learned that the office of the Vice President was involved in these activities. Because the California waiver directly relates to climate change, I'd like to ask you about the Vice President's role in the California waiver decision. It's very important to me. Was the Vice President's office involved with the deliberations on the California waiver? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Your answer is no. Okay. According to press accounts, press accounts, the vice president was involved in the issue, and the press has reported 
that the CEO of Ford and Chrysler met with Vice President Cheney prior to the denial and urged the administration to reject the waiver. Did the Vice President or his staff put any pressure on you or your staff to deny the California waiver request? No. Okay. Did the Vice President or his staff tell you they opposed the California waiver? Not that I recall. Okay. Mr. Johnson, we're looking at a mysterious last minute reversal of your position on the California waiver. We need to fully understand the reasons for that sudden change of course. Transparency is what we're trying to get to. And uh, it would be fundamentally wrong if you reversed your decision because of a meeting the vice president had with the auto industry. It would violate the Clean Air Act if the denial resulted from any pressure from the vice president's office. But the committee won't know the truth if you do not tell us. And uh, in terms of being transparent, we want to know why there was a reversal. We asked for the waiver because living in California, having worked for 20 years in the legislature, we did a lot to clean up our air. In fact, it took us 14 years for the smoking uh, policies that stopped smoking on airplanes in California airspace, and now it is a practice around the globe. So we kind of know what we're doing when we ask for a waiver. And so uh, if you could be transparent, was there any pressure put on you at all to change your own recommendations, to reverse well, your own recommendations? Well, again, I would, uh, with, uh, with due respect, uh, beg to differ with your characterization. I, I, I didn't reverse any decision. Uh, I, I made the decision, and the decision is, uh, was documented in the, in the letter of what I intended to do uh, to the governor in December. Uh, and then uh, later on, then as I said, the approximately 50-page document uh, goes into great detail uh, my decision. Uh, it was my decision. It was mine alone. Uh, and uh, as I note in the, uh, in the document that climate change is a, is a problem that's not unique to California, and my decision is grounded in the law and the facts that were before me. Uh, we have your words down in the record. But uh, was there any input from the White House uh, that uh, influenced your final decision to deny us a request for a waiver? Again, my uh, decision were based upon the law and the facts and Section, uh, was there, section 209. No, uh, let me clarify. I'm going to speak real clearly Please. so you can ask me directly. Was there any input? from the White House, either the President or Vice President, that influenced your decision? Again, I have routine conversations with All right. the executive branch. Uh, you, and, you will not answer. Hold and, on. And, and I made uh, the hold decision. Hold on. Hold mm -hmm. on. I'm asking okay. a question. I've mm -hmm. gone through this for the last hour. Okay. Yes or no? As I said, I have routine conversations. Uh, no. That doesn't, that doesn't write. Well, We're again, talking about transparency. As I said, the yes answer or is, no. The answer is uh, no. They did not make the decision. The answer is I yes. Didn't ask I that. made the decision. Maybe my English is not clear. Let me see if I can restate it. Please. Yes. You have these routine conversations. Yes. Was there anything in that? You don't have to give me the content. Was there anything in the conversation? Any input? from either the President or the Vice President, and the Vice President in particular, because we do have a record of conversations with an industry that adds to the pollution in the air. Was there any input from the Vice President that impacted on your decision to deny California Specifically its for the, waiver? Specifically for the Vice President, I don't recall any. 
In your answers said, you don't recall. I said, uh, I said, no, I don't recall any. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Issa expressed that uh, I was being unfair by taking additional time out of order. And I, in order to be fair, will yield him at this point uh, three minutes so he could pursue further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I appreciate the balance. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, Administrator Johnson, uh, you are aware that members of Congress enjoy the speech and debate exemption. Uh, it's been well documented that what we do and say with, in order to make our decisions and how we come to the floor is protected from basically discovery by your branch. So it, it probably shouldn't come as a surprise, it should come as a surprise to you that we're surprised that you're not going to tell us whether or not there were conversations within the executive branch that led to your independent decision. Uh, so I hope, I hope you'll take that as a, I understand it, even if others don't. <laughs> uh, in a nutshell, you serve at the pleasure of the President. Is that correct? That's correct. But the President doesn't have the right to order you. He only has the right to either accept what you do statutorily, make independent judgment if he has statutory authority, or fire you. Isn't that essentially correct? Essentially, that's it. Okay, yes. so you have independent authority subject to that portion of the pleasure, and you've asserted that in order to make your decision. I I'd like to quote, uh, a well-known gentleman, Chairman Dingell, who says uh, he declared that this uh, regulation of uh, CO2 was a glorious mess. Do you agree with Chairman Dingell that under the current law, taking a common material that's going to be everywhere and diffuses quickly and regulating it under the existing Clean Air Act will be a glorious mess? Well, I believe that there are many intricacies and complications with, uh, with the Clean Air Act. And my personal opinion is, is that, uh, that uh, given the likely years and years of litigation that would ensue, uh, I prefer a legislative uh, approach. Uh, however, as the Chairman duly noted, I have responsibilities to administer the Clean Air Act, and that's what I'm doing by uh, beginning with an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which I will, would certainly will help the agency right. as it uh, sorts through the intimacies and intricacies of the Clean Air Act, and I trust will also help members of Congress. Now, in your consideration of granting a waiver to California, uh, did it did it occur to you, at least as to CO2, that uh, that when when you haven't yet set levels on something, you've just now been told through the courts you have the ability to set a level on. An independent request would be premature and inappropriate. Is that part of your consideration in how do you grant a waiver before you've even determined what the base is? You might, in fact, regulate to a level much more, much lower than what uh, California would. Well, actually, uh, the uh, Section 209 of the Clean Air Act actually identifies three very specific criteria, and that has to be the sole basis of my evaluation of any waiver petition. Uh, and in my judgment, California did not meet the second criteria, which is the compelling and extraordinary conditions. Uh, and I go into great detail describing uh, why I do not believe, in my judgment, they, they met those conditions. Um, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator, uh, let me ask you this. Um, it, I found it interesting that uh, when the chairman was asking you about meetings with the president, uh, you did not provide a direct answer. You talked about all these wonderful times that you have. And then when Ms. Watson asked you about the vice president, you did answer and say that you didn't have meetings with regard to the California standards. I just, I just want to make sure I understand why that, why the different, it sounds like there's a different standard there for you. Uh, it's because it's a, been it's not a different standard, sir. But uh, as I said, I have routine meetings with the executive branch, including the president. Uh, asked specifically about the vice president, and to my uh, best of my recall, he did not. Uh, I did not have any uh, conversations with him so at all. I was just trying to I at all with regard to, to this. Is that right? Uh, with regard to the California waiver, that's correct. Right. The, so um, I was just trying to clear clear that up. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you did. I I I, I just. You know, one of the things that um, this, this stuff is personal for me because I have asthma. And in my district in Baltimore, we have a high rate of asthma. And uh, the taxpayers pay you. They pay you as they pay us. 
And we in Maryland are anxious to adopt the same standards that California has. And so, you know, we, we're curious as to how our administrator, our man in the EPA, how he makes his decisions. And so, I, you know, during your time at the EPA as administrator, many of your decisions have provoked widespread public criticism and even outrage. In response, you said, and I quote, it's not a popularity contest. And, in, and you said, quote, in the end, it is a judgment and, and each of these decisions is my decision and my decision alone. Do you, you remember saying that? I do remember saying that and I agree with uh, that. But you don't get to decide whatever you want. You must base your decisions on the scientific data and the criteria that Congress established in law. The final decisions are made by the courts who determine whether your decisions conform to the law. All too frequently, their answer has been no. Chairman Westman asked you recently um, about the EPA, for the, asked the EPA for the full litigation record on, clean air, on the Clean Air Act decisions issued by this administration. It's not a pretty picture. Out of the 26 cases decided by the D.C. Circuit, EPA lost two-thirds in whole or in part. Did you know that? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I do. And uh, our then general counsel, uh, Roger Martella, uh, sent, a, I believe, sent a letter to the chairman uh, detailing all of the court cases, uh, which uh, do not reflect that kind of percentage. So yes, well, I am concerned when we lose cases. Uh, and that's why I'm doing my very best job to make sure that not only are our uh, decisions, my decision, based upon the on sound science, but on 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 good laws. Well, well, I'm glad you said that, because these losses include some of this administration's highest profile environmental rules. In 11 cases, the court said that the EPA's position was barred by the plain language of the law, which is the legal equivalent of a shutout. To date, the D.C. Circuit has reviewed eight of your decisions and has entirely or partially rejected half. Does this track record concern you? Yes. Any time that uh, the agency uh, loses a lawsuit, I think that that's, uh, that's, uh, that is important and that is of concern to me. And I know uh, EPA has fine lawyers. Uh, my concern is whether you and the White House are listening to them. Well, sir, uh, I listen to, uh, to all of my staff, including a, a great legal staff, uh, as I base my decisions. I, as I said, I base my decisions on science and on the law and on the facts that are before me. Now, the committee's investigation of your denial of the California waiver decision revealed that legal staff warned that a denial would li that you, would, you would likely lose. But you disregarded their advice. Even when EPA has lost in court the first time, that hasn't stopped the administration from trying again. This summer, EPA plans to issue a third new source review rule, which would allow dirty power plants to upgrade and increase air pollution without installing pollution control equipment. The D.C. Circuit overturned the administration's second new source review rule, as well as parts of the first. And the Supreme Court has already rejected the legal theory EPA is relying on it. Has your legal staff warned you that this rule would be highly vulnerable to legal challenge? Well, since the uh, rule is pending before the agency, that's an important issue that uh, we're, we're currently debating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Um, Mr. Uh, Cannon. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this has been a, an interesting and uh, relatively intense hearing. And uh, I'd like to give uh, Mr. Johnson the, the opportunity just to sort of respond to some questions that, uh, that he has time to respond to so that we can actually make some sense out of those. On December 19th, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, two, 2007, you announced that you would be denying California's waiver request. And on February 29th, 2008, you released the complete decision document explaining the decision. Were you advised that the decision to deny California's waiver request was supported by the law? Yes. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I, uh, the staff presented me a wide range of options. Uh, we went through each of those options, and each one uh, uh, certainly uh, were those that were not defensible uh, were eliminated, and the ones that were present options that were presented to me, including denial, 
uh, were were uh, were presented, and ultimately that's the decision that I made. So, so there were some options, perhaps, out there that didn't make it to you because they were not legally justifiable. Uh, if yeah, I don't know which ones were or were not, but uh, certainly the ones that were presented to me were legally defensible, well, including well, a denial. Uh, we uh, advise that the decision to deny the waiver, uh, a waiver requested, uh, was supported by the facts of, of the record as well as the law? Yes, uh, and in fact, uh, we have an approximately 50 page uh, decision document that goes into great detail uh, detailing my decision and based upon all of the facts. So you were presented with options that were justified by the law and the facts, and then you made a decision, and that decision was then. Uh, uh, substantiated by the law and the facts in yes. your decision of right, right. Yes. <clears throat> was denying California's uh, waiver request one of the options? It was clearly one of the options that was presented to you by your staff. That's correct. Right. Do you have any reason to believe your staff would present you with an option that was not supported by the law or the facts of the record? I do not. Is there anything else you'd like to say about this issue since you've uh, been hectic. Well, sir, I, I know that the chairman and other members of the committee disagree with my decision, and I understand that. Uh, it's, uh, these decisions are not easy decisions, uh, but I made the right decision. I made the decision based upon the facts, based upon the law, what the law directs me to, uh, and uh, I stand by that, and it was my decision and my decision alone. Thank you. Just answered the, the, the next question I was, I was about to ask. It was your decision. Do you stand by that decision today? Absolutely. You know, I, uh, I personally have some environmental bona fides. I uh, worked in the Reagan administration after uh, the surface mining law had been passed, and the first set of regulations had been done in the, under the Carter administration. The second had been done uh, under uh, Secretary Jim Watt. And uh, both were probably extreme. Uh, it is very difficult to find a middle path that, that actually works, works for industry and works for the American people and uh, works for, for the environment. Um, I, I just want you to understand that some of us understand how difficult these things are. It's especially difficult when, you're, you're, when the world changes and technology has changed the world around us, has changed uh, the, the world in which we can uh, regulate and manage regulation, and to suggest that we could never do anything new would, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, mm -hmm. would bind us, tie us up in a way that would not make any sense at all. And in fact, I would hope that in America we would start looking at uh, how we can actually move away from federal centralized regulation uh, to more local regulation uh, throughout the country. And I think uh, our information technology gives us that opportunity. Our understanding of the, the science of, uh, of pollution and uh, what is harmful to our bodies, what's harmful to the environment, is uh, is moving rapidly forward. And I would hope that uh, the hectoring you felt today will not be perpetuated in the future by by whoever replaces you and others, uh, but uh, rather is is a thoughtful review of what happens so that we can help guide, be sort of bumpers instead of being. Well, sir, I, I appreciate that, and I, uh, I also respect uh, the, the role of Congress and the important role in oversight, and I'm very supportive of, of oversight responsibility, and I'm also uh, supportive of transparency, but as you can well imagine, I have to also be supportive of the ability to have candid conversations, uh, have advice, uh, so that I can make decisions that are independent decisions. Uh, whether that be independent decisions from Congress or independent decisions, again, under the law, or independent decisions from the White House or anybody else. Uh, and uh, I do respect the oversight responsibility, and I believe that the thousands of pages and the depositions and all the rest demonstrate to me that I went through a very thoughtful, I went through an excruciating number of, of uh, briefings and details so that I could be best equipped to make the most informed decision. And so, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the, those remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I see my time has expired. May I just uh, thank Ms. Dudley for being here. She, uh, her office is also under the jurisdiction of the committee that I am the ranking member of on, on judiciary. We spent some time together. I appreciate her being here, and perhaps some other time we can ask more questions of you, Ms. Dudley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Cannon. Uh, A question to you. 
Yes. Yeah. Is it possible for us to get a copy? Uh, uh, Mr. Johnson has spoken of the 50-page report, and I think it's in the public domain. Can we access a copy of that? We'll uh, make it available to you. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. I'd like to recognize myself. Uh, the, the, the Constitution is clear. Congress passes the laws, and the executive branch must faithfully execute them. Uh, Administrator Johnson, we knew what your professional positions were as the head of EPA. You had a record. You heard from an advisory committee. You heard from your staff. You got input from all sorts of groups, environmentalists and industry. That's all appropriate that you get all this input in to make the decision. We knew what your decision was on three areas. Uh, ozone, the California waiver, and the greenhouse gas uh, question. Well, at least we know what you sent to the White House. And then you reversed yourself after you had a candid conversation with the White House. So that would indicate that you're getting input from the President, which you may think is important. But it also may indicate that the President is really making the decisions. Uh, and what we need to do our oversight job is to find out on what basis he is telling you that, he ought to, that you ought to make a different decision than what you initially proposed. Now, in the case of ozone, the Clean Air Act clearly states that air quality standards must be set by you using your best judgment based on the latest scientific information. The law does not provide that it's the President's decision. It says it's your decision. Now, I understand some constitutional scholars would say, when can Congress grants an agency authority, the President is granted that authority as well. Other scholars disagree. We don't have to resolve that issue. But in the setting of ozone standards, the science and staff work all pointed in one direction. Set a secondary standard that uses a seasonal form. EPA's record is clear. But li in literally the last hours of the rulemaking process, when you faced the deadline in which you had to come out with a rule, the President helped you see that you ought to reverse what EPA and what you had suggested. And the record does not explain how the President made his decision. Now, we issued a subpoena both to Ad Administrator Johnson and Administrator Dudley to provide documents that will help the committee understand how this decision was made. Ms. Dudley, the subpoena required you to produce the documents by April 18th. Mr. Johnson, you were required to produce the documents by May 6th. Unfortunately, you both continued to withhold documents. I wrote to both of you on Friday. I inform you that unless there is an assertion of executive privilege, you must produce the documents at this hearing today. Administr Administrator Johnson, has the President asserted executive privilege over the documents responsive to the subpoena? Um, my understanding that, sir, that executive privilege is not something to be invoked lightly and that constitutional confrontations between the legislative and executive branches should be avoided uh, whenever possible. Uh, at this time, uh, I'm not making an assertion of executive privilege today. Instead, I'm committing that to you, that my staff remains uh, available and willing to continue our discussions uh, to about how to reach a mutually agreeable resolution regarding the remaining documents. As well, we've, uh, I, my staff earlier, right before the hearing, delivered uh, a number of additional documents on the ozone, ozone NACs. Administrator Dudley, as the President asserted executive privilege over the documents that we have requested of you pursuant to a subpoena. Um, I know that our lawyers have been discussing the documents. We have produced over 7,000 pages. And in fact, I have a, a letter delivered to you from OMB General Counsel today that, with your permission, I would like to put on the record. Without objection, we will have it in the record. Well, during my tenure as chairman of this committee, we have all established a track record of making reasonable accommodations to executive branch interests that have arisen in committee investigations. In this case, you are trying to shield the White House from reasonable oversight, and that is not a reasonable position or an acceptable one. The President's precedents are clear. Unless there is a valid claim of executive privilege, you need to turn over the documents. As Chairman Burton recognized when he was chairman, Quote, the only privilege under which the President may withhold subpoena documents is an executive privilege, end quote. Ranking member Davis took the same position. This investigation, there has been no assertion of executive privilege, and the documents the committee seeks are central to understanding whether the President has complied with the law. This is a 
serious issue and your defiance of the subpoena is a serious matter that the committee is going to have to address. And an example of this is whether in, the, in establishing the ozone uh, rule, whether costs were taken into consideration in a surreptitious way. And we know what the Supreme Court has to say about that matter. And we also know uh, that uh, uh, Ms. Dudley has a March 6 memo from the White House that was sent to EPA where she criticized EPA for failing to respond to economic values in setting the environmental standard. Well, one of her objections seems to be EPA proposal would be too costly to industry. <coughs> that, we want to know more about that. We want to know on what basis that position is reached and others. So I'm telling you both that unless you assert executive privilege, this committee has always stood by the fact that uh, we expect uh, the compliance with the subpoena. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've taken five minutes and 41 seconds. Gentlemen, we've given five minutes and Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to follow up on that. The President's involvement in the ozone proceeding, as I understand it, is not only uh, allowed, and it's not improper influence, but in fact is consistent with President Clinton's even greater involvement in setting the 1997 uh, standard. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And uh, <clears throat> I wasn't here in 1997, but I don't believe that uh, uh, the deliberative process between the agency, that, that internal process, was ever demanded that it be uh, exposed. Uh, I don't, do any of you know if there was a record under uh, the previous, one of the previous chairmen where they demanded to know everything that led to uh, President Clinton uh, assisting in the decision-making process, finally made by the EPA, but but uh, his input into that standard in 1997? Uh, I don't know. Well, I don't think there was. And, and I, think, I think we may be working with slightly different standards of what is appropriate. Uh, Will the gentleman yield? Of course, Mr. Chairman. Well, I do want to indicate that uh, these standards that you're talking about were exa exhaustively examined by Congress. In the 105th Congress, there were approximately 30 days of hearings and at least 10 committees on this topic. EPA Administrator Carol Browner personally testified over a dozen times regarding the standards. Our own committee conducted an investigation about the matter as well. Uh, Mr. McIntosh, who was the subcommittee chairman, requested OMB produce all records related to uh, their review, uh, WIRA's view of the proposed rules. In response to this and other congressional requests, OMB produced thousands of pages and documents, including internal White House communications, and apparently withheld only two memoranda to the President from senior advisors within the executive branch of the President. So I, I, that Cong this record demonstrates that Congress, especially our committee, spared no effort in conducting oversight over the Clinton rulemaking. It also shows that the Clinton administration was extraordinarily responsive to our committee's extensive demands for interviews and documents. Well, and I appreciate the reclaiming my time. I, it certainly shows that uh, we have a long tradition of looking into it and uh, that we also have a long tradition of recognizing that the President has a role to set in the, uh, to uh, participate in the standard setting, both President Clinton and now President Bush. I'd like to get to one closing matter because I, I think we've sort of made the point uh, with the, uh, the inclusions of these graphs and so on that uh, the difference uh, in the secondary standard would, would have made no difference. So I, I think we'll go on to uh, out of ozone and on to uh, CO2. Uh, Administrator Johnson, uh, <clears throat> if you were to have granted California's waiver request, and if California went into global cap and trade, and if California reduced its CO2, uh, assuming that China and India continue to produce new coal facilities that have absolutely no scrubbers that are just putting out CO2, would it really be all that significant when you look at the present level in California reduced by, let's say, 20 or 30 percent versus the new coal plants being put up on a weekly basis in China? Well, if I, if I may, that was not the, those are not the criteria which I had to base the California waiver No, decision. no, I understand that. But you're, so, you're, you're, so you're I, obviously So I based, I based that on were there uh, the criteria that were in the law. Now, asking the other question, the challenge that we have as a nation, and as we have across all the states, including my home state of Maryland, uh, is that all contributes to global climate change. And so, in fact, what is happening in Maryland or what's happening in Florida or New York or wherever is all contributing to okay, so, climate change. So I, and I want to focus on that because although it's not the primary portion of this hearing, I think as we close this hearing uh, as to this panel, I think it's important. We have to get down 
the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere on a worldwide basis if we are going to be effective in reducing CO2 worldwide, thus assuming that the scientists' predictions are right, that if we continue putting more CO2 in, we will by definition be contributing to global warming. We make that assumption. This committee has studied it extensively. Based on that assumption, isn't it a global issue, one that requires treaties and a reduction on a global basis if we are going to be effective? Well, I believe that it requires uh, uh, each of the nations, uh, whether you are a rapidly developing economy like China or India or the United States or European Union, uh, to, uh, to, to be leaders and to move forward. Uh, and that each, each situation is different. Uh, Fifty percent of our electricity comes from coal. Australia, it is 82 percent. Uh, uh, France is much less than that. It is in less than, less than 10 percent. One, one so, final, final question, because I think we have made that point. You have a responsibility as a Federal officer to all Americans. And if I understand the standard under which you rejected California's waiver, part of that is an equal protection, that, that States are not allowed to arbitrarily have separate standards without need because, in fact, you are protecting all of us and our, our commerce against arbitrary changes in standards by States. Isn't that true? Well, again, the three criteria that focus specifically on California, uh, states are not, other States are not allowed to, to, to take any other action themselves unless the waiver was granted and then they can adopt what the California standard is. Uh, and that the issue that, uh, that was before me was, was there compelling and extraordinary conditions? And my decision, again, part of those 50 pages, clearly shows, and the science clearly shows, whether it is sea level rise. Sea level rise is more of a problem for the East Coast than it is for the West Coast. Uh, temperature, uh, acceleration of temperature or, or higher temperatures, yes, California experienced higher temperatures, but there's other parts of the country that make it worse. And so as it looked at, uh, the criteria, particularly compelling and extraordinary, in my judgment, based upon the science, uh, did not meet the standard. Thank you. And thank you for this uh, hearing, you. Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Issa. We have uh, another panel of four witnesses. If members would permit, I would like to move on to the next panel. Mr. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Chairman, can I just follow up just quickly on one item? The standard that we are complaining about with the ozone standard, the Science Committee was saying it should be at 0.07, right? Minimum or, ma or maximum. maximum? Maximum, but we gave a range, okay. uh, 06 to 07. California's standard, Mr. Johnson, is sitting at the maximum that it was recommended. Now, traditionally, has there been ever a time, and I'm trying to remember it in my my 30 years of involvement in this issue, has there ever really been too many regulations where the Federal standard has been more, you know, more stringent than the California standard? Uh, I don't recall. I just want to say when we argue about this, we are talking 5, 7 percent. But I think we admit that, I, I know you, you guys are going to get sick and tired of hearing me talk about California. And, and when we get to greenhouse, I will beat our breast about importing all the electricity but not wanting to have the coal plants. But what I am saying is in all fairness, we are so close on this issue, it is not the huge element. And I would ask our toxicologists, how many deaths per million are we talking about here, which we usually talk about? So I yield. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that there are some big issues out there, and I wish that we would be setting some standards here, like stop burning coal here in the Capitol or buying coal um, electricity for, for, Washington, for the Capitol here. And I like to, I hope that we can work together at getting a waiver for, Sand, uh, for California on the greenhouse and the fuel mixture and work on making the capital truly um, uh, greenhouse neutral, CO neutral rather than these phony offsets. And I look forward to working with Mr. Chairman. With your extensive background on it, I think we have got some great opportunities if we just work together on this. So thank you very much for the added time. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. Ms. Watson, I understand you wanted an equal amount of time with two minutes. It will yield to you if you wish to pursue it. Uh, yes, because my state is involved, and we have tried to address pollution there, you know, largest state, 38 million people and all their cars. I think every family has 13 cars. So this is really important to me, and I am taking it personally, too. Uh, when EPA makes decisions that don't meet the law and loses in court 
environmental protection is delayed and the public indeed is hurt. Uh, these aren't the only cost or problems. State must adopt each new federal requirement into state law. And those efforts are wasted as well. Now, I have uh, their letters that are addressed to uh, the chairman from Lee's Leo Dosoff, the administration administrator of the Deci Division of Environmental Protection for the State of Nevada. Now, this isn't a partisan issue, for Nevada has a Republican governor. Administrator Dozdorf says, and I quote, we appreciate your efforts to identify and quantify the impact of EPA's failed rulemaking attempts. Every time we are forced to develop programs that are clearly in conflict with the federal environmental law, it is an opportunity wasted and environmental protections delayed. The resource implications to a small state like ours and the negative effect on our relationship with the EPA are enormous. These impacts will be felt for years and years to come. This is an extraordinary protest from a state environmental protection agency and uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have unanimous consent to enter this letter into the record. Without objections, that'll be the order. And generally, his time has expired. Mr. Cannon requested time as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me just point out that you made the, the comment that uh, on the ozone rule uh, that you wondered if costs were taken into, an account, into account in a surreptitious, I suppose that means uh, inappropriate way. I think that's vitally important. That's the, the work of this committee is to oversee those kinds of things. I would hope that we would be able to find those problems, not just suggest the existence of, of such problems. And uh, just in, uh, uh, finally, Mr. Uh, Johnson, w it, it, suppose California had been allowed to have their uh, CO2 lower standard, had the waiver granted, would that have made any difference as to CO2 in California or in the country? Any significant difference? Well, it's, a, it's an issue of debate, but uh, certainly uh, based upon what we know is that uh, we have both a national and a global problem. And so uh, automobiles and improving efficiency there uh, certainly help, but since it is a global air pollutant, uh, it is highly questionable how much effect it would really have. So but again, I have, to, again I have to say for the record, those are not the criteria. Right. The criteria I had to, are there compelling and extraordinary conditions in California? But the, the request for the waiver had to be more symbolic than substantive. Well, again, uh, it, was, uh, it was a formal waiver request and certainly uh, we did due diligence and held uh, two hearings. I had many, many briefings and, and certainly having a 50-page or approximately 50-page uh, decision document on a waiver is, uh, is uh, unusual, if nothing else, in its size and, and uh, all of the issues that are there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, as we end your participation in this hearing, I, I want to tell you something very clearly. This hearing isn't about what you decide. It's about how you decide and the integrity of the process. And uh, I don't think you ought to leave this room satisfied that you as a that you deflected questions and avoided to tell us information that we're entitled to have. Uh, judging by some of the responses I think you've given us uh, today, I expect you to regard this part of the process with derision. For many of us, we walk away from this hearing astounded that you as a career EPA employee are willing to be part of a process that makes a mockery of the rulemaking process and that you're willing to come here and pretend that what really happened didn't happen. Uh, in, in, the, uh, 
Uh, and in this case, we have the record to guide us. It tells us how EPA's best legal and scientific experts supported granting California's petition and adopting a new ozone standard for the environment. The record tells us you ultimately agreed with EPA's experts and gave those recommendations to the White House, and we know the White House overruled you. Uh, yet your testimony pretends that none of this happened, and it pretends you reached the ultimate decisions independently and with a scientific and legal basis. Your staff knows this isn't true, and we know that it isn't true. And as someone who has long fought for EPA and strong environment protect, for environmental protections, I can't adequately express how deeply this saddens me and how poorly it reflects on the EPA. I thank the three of you for being here, and we are going to move on to our next witnesses. I now want to call forward our second panel, Dr. Francesca Grifo. Dr. Grifo is a senior scientist and director of the Union of Concerned Scientists Scientific Integrity Program. She has over 20 years of experience directing science-based projects and programs. Uh, she holds a uh, Ph.D. in botany from Cornell University. Michael Gu is the climate legislative director for the Natural Resources Defense Council. He has previously served as Majority Counsel for the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, Minor Minority Counsel for the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and is Acting Assistant General Counsel at EPA. Dr. Roger McClellan currently advises public and private organizations on issues related to air quality. He has previously served as Chair of EPA's Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee and is President of the Chemical Industry Institute of Technology. Alan Rowell is a partner with Sidley Austin and is chair of the firm's Information Law and Privacy Practice Group, and he's also a member of the firm's Government and Internal Investigations Group and Appellate uh, Group as well. I uh, welcome you to our hearing. It's the practice of this committee that all witnesses testify under oath. So I would like to ask each of you to please stand and, uh, it, while I ask you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Dr. Griffo, we want to call on you first. You're, all, for all of you, your pre prepared statements are in the record in full. We would like to ask you to try to limit your oral presentations to five minutes. The clock will indicate when it is read that the five minutes have expired. Uh, please go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the committee. I am a senior scientist, as you said, and director of the Scientific Integrity Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, a leading science-based nonprofit working for a healthy environment and a safer world. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak to you this, this afternoon about the problem of political interference in the work of Federal Government scientists. Yeah. The United States has enjoyed prosperity and health in large part because of its strong and sustained commitment to independent science. A nation, as the nation faces new challenges at home and growing competitiveness abroad, the need for a robust Federal scientific enterprise remains critical. Unfortunately, an epidemic of political interference in Federal science threatens this legacy. Political interference in EPA's decision regarding the air quality standard for ground level ozone is emblematic of the problem of manipulation, suppression and distortion of science at the EPA. You have already heard that EPA Administrator Stephen Johnson issued the final ozone standard at an arbitrary level inconsistent with the analysis of EPA scientists and independent science advisors and ultimately not sufficiently protective of public health. You have heard that the White House pressured the EPA to consider economic costs associated with tightening the ozone standard. The law, as affirmed by a 2001 Supreme Court decision, requires the standard be based solely on best available science. EPA leadership failed to meet that objective. The White House's interference or meddling in the ozone decision is not a standalone incident. Time and time again, White House officials or EPA political appointees have stepped in to second guess, manipulate, or suppress the work of EPA scientists, <laughs> threatening the agency's ability to protect human health and the environment. In our investigation of EPA scientists, our survey conducted by Iowa State University together with us, 
Hundreds of scientists report direct interference in their scientific work, fears of retaliation, and systemic disregard for the expertise of EPA's advisory committee. Our survey found that 889 scientists reported personally experiencing one of these events in the last five years. In essay responses, nearly 100 EPA scientists self-identified OMB, Office of Management and Budget, as the primary culprit in this interference. It's important to note that we didn't ask them about OMB. The question was much broader. They volunteered that. 232 scientists had personally experienced frequent or occasional changes or edits during review that changed the meaning of scientific findings, not just routine edits, but those that change the meaning. 285 scientists had personally experienced frequent or occasional selective or incomplete use of data to justify a specific regulatory outcome. 153 scientists had personally experienced frequent or occasional pressure to ignore impacts of a regulation on sensitive populations. 536 scientists felt that the agency occasionally, seldom, or never heeds advice from independent scientific advisory committees. This result was markedly worse at the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards, which works closely with the advisory committees to set the NACs. Half of these respondents felt the EPA did not heed the advice of the advisory committees. The White House has rewritten EPA scientific documents concerning climate change, pressured EPA scientists to support predetermined conclusions regarding the health effects of toxic mercury pollution, and pushed for rules that politicize the scientific findings contained in the IRIS Toxics database. Science has been misused on air pollution, asbestos, fuel efficiency, mountaintop removal mining, oil extraction, pesticides, plywood plant pollution, toxic selenium contamination, and on and on. Fortunately, this is not a problem without a solution. A suite of reforms are detailed in our report, Interference at the EPA, but here are the most timely. The House and Senate overwhelmingly approved bipartisan legislation to strengthen whistleblower protections for federal employees. It is crucial that the final legislation, now in conference committee, contain specific protections for scientists who expose efforts to suppress or alter federal research. The EPA should increase openness in its decision-making process. If research results and analysis by EPA scientists are made public before they drop into, as the GAO put it, the black box of OMB, attempts to distort science will be exposed. The expanded reach of the OMB must be pushed back. Questioning the scientific consensus of agency experts is not OMB's proper role. EPA should adopt media, communication, and scientific publication policies that ensure taxpayer-funded scientists and their research are accessible to Congress and the public, and scientists need to be proactively made aware of these rights. Finally, there are two actions that can take place immediately. Administrator Johnson should send a clear message to all political appointees that he will not tolerate any attempts to alter or suppress federal research. Just as EPA Administrator William Ruckelshaus did 25 years ago, Administrator Johnson should pledge to operate EPA in a fishbowl. As we would welcome a dialogue with Administrator Johnson, although as of this morning he has not responded to repeated requests to begin that conversation. We look forward to continuing our work with the 110th Congress to restore scientific integrity to federal policymaking. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greffel. Uh, Mr. Michael Gu. Thank you, Chairman Waxman and Ranking Member uh, Davis for the opportunity, uh, and Chairman Watson and Ranking Member Issa, <laughs> for the opportunity to testify here uh, regarding EPA's new national ambient air quality standards for ozone. Uh, my name is Michael Gu. I'm the Climate Legislative Director for the Natural Resources Defense Council. NRDC is a national nonprofit organization of scientists, lawyers, and environmental specialists dedicated to protecting public health and the environment. Um, I, 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 before I turn to my scripted statement, I just wanted to make a couple of points uh, here about some of what we've heard today. Um, and Mr. Johnson uh, won't admit to talking to the White House about the um, uh, ozone decision, but we have the EPA talking points from the meeting with the President. Uh, and they say that the seasonal form is the most scientifically defensible, and they say that the seasonal form is the most legally defensible. Um, and the question that we have uh, is what caused the Administrator to change his mind quite literally overnight 
so that the uh, EPA has staff had to scramble around to change the document um, uh, within 24 hours. Um, and then just to also respond to a point, a, tr a chart was put up. Uh, uh, Administrator Dudley said that there would be no more uh, attainment areas with the uh, secondary standard set the same as the primary standard. Um, but it is not just the form uh, that, that regulates the stringency of the standard, it is also the level. And the CASAC, and I am not quite sure uh, Dr. Henderson did not have the opportunity to comment on this, but the CASAC said uh, that the level should be between 15 and 17, and the level was actually set at 21. And, and of course, therefore, it was not as uh, much more protective than the primary standard. Now, uh, let me turn to my prepared remarks. Um, the first point I just want to make with regard to ozone is that we now know that ozone kills people. Um, we, we say that ozone uh, it, it results in excess or premature mortality. That is a fancy way of saying that smog kills people. Um, and ozone pollution also leads to a host of other health effects, uh, susceptibility to infection, asthma attacks, school absences, emergency room visits, and even, even overnight admission into the hospital. And, and these are real effects with real consequences for us, for our children, for our elderly, and our infirm. And the second point I wish to emphasize is that ozone pollution is ubiquitous. Uh, according to EPA, approximately 140 million Americans live in areas that violate the 1997 8-hour standard, including more than 16 million children, more than 6 million people aged 75 and older, and more than 9 million people who suffer from asthma. Putting these two, two facts together, it is clear that ozone is a major public health problem in the United States. Um, in my testimony, I have characterized the decision of the administrator as a shameful distortion of the scientific and regulatory process for setting national ambient air quality standards. I say that uh, from my vantage point as a former EPA attorney who spent more than four years uh, developing and defending the standards uh, set forth uh, in the Clinton administration, which were ultimately upheld by the United States Supreme Court. Prior to this administration, in an unbroken line of cases extending back nearly 40 years, these standards were repeatedly upheld by the courts. And since its creation in 1977, nearly every administrator prior to this one has made decisions uh, regarding the National Ambient Air Quality Standards within the scientific boundaries set by the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. This administrator, despite very clear recommendations from CASAC, chose to disregard its advice. The administrator had before him an enormous opportunity to advance the cause of public health protection in the United States. He had a voluminous scientific record documenting health effects at, low, at levels below the existing standard. He had a unanimous recommendation from CASAC. And he had a very clear directive from the Congress and the courts that he must set the standard to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety, erring on the side of caution. In short, he had all the elements that he needed to set a highly defensible standard that would have protected public health with an adequate margin of safety. And it distresses me to report that the administrator squandered that opportunity. The record is clear. The administrator's decision is not based on the latest scientific evidence. It is not based on the recommendations of CASEC. It is not, does not protect public health and it does not include a margin of safety. Some may try and defend this decision as a reasonable policy decision. Uh, or an attempt to, just, or attempt to justify the decision on the basis of vague notions of uncertainty. But to say something as a policy judgment or to say that a decision is based on uncertainty adds little by way of actual rationale. The question is, what is the policy and in what direction does any alleged uncertainty cut? Is the policy to honor the latest scientific evidence and the recommendation of CASEC erring on the side of safety? I would submit that the record before us makes clear the answers to those questions. In the end, these standards will be replaced by ones that reflect the science and the law. But in the meantime, our citizens' lungs and their health will suffer as a result. Uh, Chairman Waxman, I commend your efforts and the efforts of your staff to bring this deplorable situation into the light of day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. McClellan. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee. I am Roger McClellan, Independent Advisor in Air Quality Issues. My home is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I appreciate the invitation to present my views on EPA's recent review and revision of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for Ozone. I ask that my written testimony be entered in the record as though read in its entirety. Let me summarize. For more than four decades, I have been contributing to the development of science needed to address important societal issues concerned with air quality. I am proud to have served on many EPA scientific advisory committees 
from the origin of the agency to the present time under administrations of both parties. This included service on the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, which I chaired, 1988-92, and on panels that have considered all the criteria air pollutants. I served on the ozone panel and advised on the 1997 standard. I did not serve in the most recent uh, ozone panel. However, I have closely followed the standard setting process that led to the final rule announced by Administrator Johnson on March 12, 2008, focusing on the primary or health-based standard. As you know, every standard has four interrelated elements, an indicator, an averaging time, a numerical level, and a statistical form. And it's important that these always be considered in their entirety. Throughout the re review process leading up to the final rule, there has been debate over the numerical level of the eight-hour averaging time standard with ozone as the uh, indicator. In my opinion, much of the debate was premature and focused on the outcome desired by some parties, a lowering of the standard even before the review of the science was complete. This resulted in a blurring of the boundary between the role of science and judgment in the setting of the standard. With publication of the proposed rule for the ozone standard, the debate intensified. That included repeated reference to the CASE Act recommendation the primary standard be set within a specific narrow numerical range, 0 0.060 to 0 0.070 ppm. In my opinion, the CASE Act panel moved from the science arena into the policy arena with its strident advocacy of an upper bright line value of 0 0.070 ppm for the primary standard. CASAC selection of this narrow range and an upper bright line value followed the template that CASAC had been used, used with the PM 2.5 standard. In that case, CASAC, the panel I served on, advocated setting the PM 2.5 annual standard setting at 13 to 14 micrograms per cubic meter, a view that I dissented from, and the 24-hour standard at 25 to 35 micrograms per cubic meter. The administrator made policy judgments in setting the 24-hour standard at a level of 35 micrograms per cubic meter, a drastic reduction from the previous, and reaffirmation of the annual standard at a level of 15 micrograms per cubic meter. Kasach argued, with the exception of myself, one other, that he had made a political choice and ignored the science. In the case of ozone, Administrator Johnson made a policy judgment to set the ozone standard at 0 0.075 ppm averaged over eight hours. The value was actually consistent with the original advice of his own staff, 0 0.075 ppm up to a level slightly below the current standard which we know was 0 0.080, but with rounding could have been up to 0 0.084. Again, Kasach argued he made a political decision and ignored the science. In my view, the Kasach panels have not fully understood nor communicated the extent to which the recommendations they communicated to the administrator represented both their interpretation of the science and their personal policy preferences on the numerical level of the standard. Even before the final rule for ozone was announced, CASAC scheduled a teleconference to develop unsolicited advice to the administrator. This clearly moved CASAC from the scientific advisory arena into the political arena. This was evidenced by panel members noting the importance of getting the record right for the courts and the suggestion that the administrator should have resigned rather than cooperate with OMB and the White House. The panel's letter on that teleconference continues to suggest that somehow science and scientists alone can establish the appropriate standard or at a minimum dictate the upper bound acceptable for a policy decision. The Clean Air Act does not call for a standard setting committee with the administrator merely serving as a rubber stamp for the committee's judgments. The Clean Air Act wisely calls for a Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee to provide advice to the administrator on policy judgments that under the Clean Air Act are the exclusive responsibility of the administrator. In my opinion, the administrator has appropriately exercised his authority 
in making policy judgments on both the revised PM 2.5 and ozone standards, making selections from among an array of science-based options. The basis for his policy decisions are well documented in both final rules, including consideration of both the science and personal judgments of KSAC. And they are also consistent with the Supreme Court's interpretation of Clean Air Act. He did not consider cost. However, he did exercise judgment appropriately in deciding how low is low enough in setting the numerical level of both standards from among an array of science-based options. There is no scientific methodology that can be used as a substitute for the administrator's judgment. I welcome the opportunity to address any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. Uh, Mr. Rowell. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Issa, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today to provide my views on the authority of the President to influence the decisions of his subordinates in the executive branch. It is an honor to appear before you. I am testifying today in a personal capacity based on my interest and background in administrative and constitutional law. I, I am currently engaged in private law practice and have previously served as General Counsel of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, General Counsel of the Office of Management and Budget, and as Associate Counsel to the President. Until recently, I also served in a part-time capacity as Vice Chairman of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. My views here are focused only on the general issue of presidential authority to influence and direct the regulatory actions and decisions of the executive branch under Article II of the Constitution. It is my view that the President is and should be in control of the executive branch. But importantly, this does not derogate or diminish Congress's power to set policy by legislation and to oversee the executive's execution of the laws. Rather, the unitary executive means that it must be the President and not some relatively unknown subordinate, narrow agency or obscure technical committee who is responsible to the public to take care that the laws are well and faithfully executed. In short, the unitary executive concept promotes more effective rulemaking by bringing a broader perspective to bear on important regulatory decisions and enhances democratic accountability for regulatory decision making by pinning responsibility on the President to answer to the public for important regulatory actions taken by his or her administration. Setting standards requisite to protect public health and welfare is inherently a policy exercise because Congress and the courts acknowledge that government regulations cannot and need not achieve zero risk. Indeed, it is the President's responsibility, not just his right, to ensure that executive branch regulatory decisions, to the extent Congress has left the executive with some discretion, reflect the President's own policy judgments. That way, the public can hold the President accountable for important regulatory judgments or, alternatively, look to Congress for stronger, smarter, or more specific laws. If the EPA Administrator does not agree with the President, he or she may resign or be replaced, but there are no grounds to complain that the President's position is undue interference. The reasons why the Constitution established a powerful President are well known. In short, the framers were acutely conscious of the debilitating weaknesses that resulted from executive by committee during the Revolutionary War and under the Articles of Confederation. They clearly understood that putting one person in charge of the executive branch would promote accountability. The Constitution adopted a unitary executive in order that the American people would know exactly whom to credit or whom to blame if the laws were not faithfully and effectively discharged. If re responsibility is diffused, then the ability of the public to influence and choose their government is diluted. And presidents of both parties have asserted the right to oversee and direct the actions and decisions of their regulatory agencies. Former Chief Judge of the D.C. Circuit Patricia Walt, who served as Assistant Attorney General for Legislative Affairs in the Carter Administration and was appointed to the D.C. Circuit by President Carter, strongly supported the power of the President to direct his or her subordinates in the executive branch. In 1981, she authored the leading opinion on presidential control over rulemaking, Sierra Club v. Kossel. Interestingly, Judge Wald was joined in that opinion by then Judge, now Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Judge Wald addressed arguments advanced by environmental plaintiffs who claimed that President Carter had improperly interfered with EPA rulemaking in order to impose weaker pollution controls than the technical staff at EPA desired. 
She categorically rejected this criticism of President Carter's decisive role. Echoing Alexander Hamilton, Judge Wald opined that preserving the President's flexibility to direct his or her subordinates was so important that it was not legally, legally required for the executive branch to publicly disclose the details of White House and presidential contacts. Similarly, President Clinton further codified and solidified the process and desirability of presidential control over executive branch rulemaking. And you've heard uh, testimony earlier today about Executive Order 12866, which required that agency regulations be consistent with the President's priorities and the principles set forth in the executive order. Um, as you heard also, President Clinton himself was personally involved in improving the 1997 ozone standard that was the, a precursor of the standard involved today. And just as is the case with the current ozone rule, and as was the case with President Carter's sulfur and particulate matter rules that Judge Wald addressed, EPA ultimately chose in 1997 a pollution standard that was more lenient than the one favored by agency staff and recommended by the uh, KSAC Committee of Scientific Advisors. I would submit that it makes sense as a matter of public policy to acknowledge and respect the President's ultimate dominion over the executive branch. If Federal regulations do not serve the public well, either because they are too restrictive or too permissive or simply not well designed, the President and Congress, of course, should take the blame. If the regulations are reasonable and accomplish the public's goals efficiently, then the President and Congress should receive the credit. Technical advisors are essential to the rulemaking process, but the buck has to stop with the person who answers to the people, that is, the President. Thank you for considering my views. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rao. We'll now proceed to questions. And for, uh, to start off the questioning, I want to recognize Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Gu, I felt your passion in your testimony. I'm very passionate, too, because my grandfather, in coming here, uh, once into California, I'm speaking of. And once he got here, he found he had to go over and live in um, Arizona. When he came back, he fell dead in the streets, leaving a widow with seven children. The oldest was my mother. And so uh, that was before we had the Clean Air Act. Um, I spent 17 years as the chair of Health and Human Services in the California State Senate. We fought viciously with those who did not want to clean up the air because they felt it would impact on, uh, I guess, their profits. So uh, you've expressed grave concerns that um, Administrative Johnson's decisions on the new ozone standards were not based on science and the law. In your view, is this failure to base an EPA decision on science and the law an isolated incident? And could you put this into context in terms of this administration's overall record of implementing the Clean Air Act? I would be glad to, uh, Congressman Watson. Um, this is uh, not an isolated instance at all. Uh, far from it. Uh, what we have seen in the past eight years is a concerted uh, attempt to effectively dismantle the Clean Air Act uh, through implementation and enforcement. Um, and we have seen it uh, in a number of instances from new source review to mercury pollution to um, uh, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards and their position on greenhouse gases. As I mentioned and as, as you note, air pollution is very serious business here uh, in the United States. Uh, more Americans die from air pollution than die from drunk driving and HIV AIDS put together. Um, so, um, and most of that is from particulate matter air pollution, which I would uh, mention as a good example of the same kind of decision making that we have seen where the administrator chose to disregard the clear advice of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. The very next decision that we will be seeing in the National Ambient Air Quality Standards area will be with regard to lead, a known toxic air pollutant. Um, and we are, are concerned that the next decision with regard to lead may resemble the past two national ambient air quality decisions. Let me just ask you this. Uh, have you seen this disregard uh, for the scientific input as a problem for the agency over a period of time? Um, 
I think over uh, the last eight years, uh, this has been a very difficult time for people uh, at the agency. Uh, if you look at the depositions and you look at the record uh, that Chairman Waxman has compiled, you see that any number of staff, uh, career staff, career at uh, staff attorneys were saying things like, I've never seen this in the last 30 years. Um, it, it, it's, it's been extremely distressing. The career staff at EPR are extremely dedicated uh, and they're, they're dedicated to the science and to public health protection. Uh, they, they have not not been well served in this administration. Well, I want to thank you very much. I feel the same exact way California is my state, and I want to thank you. The Clean Air Act says that the EPA must use its understanding of science to protect people's health and lives from air pollution. And disregarding the law and the science subjects people and our environment to grave harm. Uh, my family was affected by the fact that we didn't have these standards and I lost a grandfather whom I never knew. So uh, the rejection of our request in California hit us very, very hard. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for this time. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, Mr. Cannon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gu, how many people die of AIDS each year? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have the precise figure, but I will, will get it for you. Uh, more than 45,000 people die of uh, uh, particulate matter pollution from power Thank plants you. alone uh, actually, in the United me, States We are going year. on with a very short number of minutes here, two minutes each, so if you don't mind, I am just going to ask some very quick and clear questions. Mr. Ms. Grifo or Dr. Grifo, uh, how many members are there in the Union of Concerned Scientists? Uh, we, oops. we have members who are citizens and scientists from across the country, uh, roughly 200,000 that work actively with us. How many of those are scientists? Uh, I, I have know a PhD in science. I can tell you that for our particular issue, the scientific integrity issue, we have a statement. We have an activist list of 15,000 scientists from across the country. Do you the know broader one, I can get you that exact number. I would actually appreciate that. And uh, how many of uh, the members, broader membership of UCS, is uh, are government employees? I don't know, but I can. I appreciate potentially that well. find that out. And, and uh, of those who are active uh, scientists but not government employees, do you have any idea how many receive government contracts? I'm sorry. How many receive contract or money from the federal government to do research? I don't have any way of knowing that, sir. Well, we do not take any government money at the Union of Concerned I, I Scientists. Know you don't, but many of your, your scientists do. Let me just point out that that um, when you have taxpayer-funded research. And priorities change because times change. You're going to have complaints from scientists. Are you familiar with the uh, Congressional Research Services review of the study that you quoted in your in your testimony? I got it about 15 minutes ago. You should read it because ago. I think it points out. I did that read your it, study and I'm happy to respond was, to anything in it. Uh, well, it's all completely refutable. Have, it's, pardon me. I'm, I have. I, I'm yeah, happy to respond hard, to any of it. It'd be hard for you to respond. We I have too short a time, but you're, you're talking about 5,810 people that were surveyed were asked questions that were EPA scientists. You had about almost 1,600 respondents and 700 complaints. I think that this whole, you should look at that because I think it deeply undermines the credibility of your, of your statistical conclusions about this administration and the integrity of science, which I think is largely driven uh, by financial interests and the transition that is happening in society. Uh, and the change uh, of priorities that we have in America. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield Thank back. You, Mr. If I may respond, I mean, I would yeah. like to direct you to page 5 of the CRS report where it says, consequently, there are no issues related to sampling errors as there was no probability sample. Page 6 of the CRS report where it says this is not an issue here, however, this is not a sample survey but a census. And page 7 of the CRS report where it says the UCS report does provide sufficient information for any analyst to examine it and highlight some of those limitations. Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me first point out and I, that I support the waiver for greenhouse gases for California, and I look forward to working with you at authoring some legislation that will authorize that and the clean fuel strategies of California and exempt us from the federal uh, restrictions. But um, I think we need to recognize that a lot of people want to talk about this would be the first time a state would have the ability to regulate outside of its jurisdiction, because in our California strategies, we are talking about restricting the importation of certain electricity across the state boundary, which is absolutely new, and we need to take a look at that. Now, um, the concerned scientists, I want to, I was questioning here, there were 71 
issues that you took with decisions that the administration had, and you feel that there was undue political influence on these decisions? I'm sorry, what are you referring you to? You listed 71 different times that you felt there was undue political influence on some political agenda pushed by the administration in their decisions, in your, in your testimony. Um, 71, I don't think I used oh, well, the number 71. Well, the list on your testimony. Well, the list that you gave. Um, my question is, in all of this, has the concerned scientist taken a position about the, the use of ethanol in our fuel stream and its environmental and health risks? Sir, that's a different program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I can certainly put you in touch with them. Well, ma'am, let me just tell you something. I have 71 here that's been given to me by your testimony. There is Can you five, tell me what the 71 is? The I, I, 20, page 25. Oh, in the A to Z. It's actually almost 90 now, yes. Okay, 90. In that list, I don't see ethanol and its environmental damage that the largest state in the union is trying to outlaw, eliminate, and you guys have sort of walked away from it. But in the same population issue, I see, you know, four or five issues on abortion or, abor uh, or um, birth control in here. And frankly, I got to be frank with you, is how you walk away something that is as much of an environmental problem as ethanol, but then talk about the morning after pill or abstinence programs as being your major concern, I'll challenge you to abandon your political pre positions and work with us at addressing real science and, and threat issues. But this testimony here, this and the, what I would say was a lack of scientific um, way of approaching your so-called survey, wouldn't you agree that if you were doing this kind of survey you would, from a scientific point of view, there's no way an environmental regulatory agency would accept that survey as being a substantive document? First of all, I think the CRS did accept it as a substantive document. That is the thrust of what's said here. And each of the yeah. pieces in here, well, we can go through them one by one, and I'm happy to talk about them. But the point of the A to Z guide is, if you have documentation of political interference in science, I would love to see it. Everything in the A to Z guide has primary documentation. If you've got it, we'll analyze, analyze it. We'll put it up there. Well, then I would, ask, I would ask that over almost 20 years, a group that claims to be scientific, where do you stand? on forcing the state of California to continue to burn ethanol on fuel when the science says it's bad. It's not the issue of this hearing. I'm sorry. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be brief. I'd ask unanimous consent that the, uh, I know it's in the record, but at this point in the record, the Congressional Research Service report be, in fact, put into Without the record. Without objection, that would be the order. Uh, and uh, I, for one, will take uh, CRS as independent uh, and certainly uh, would welcome the university, uh, uh, sorry, the Union of Concerned Scientists to, to submit to us where they think that somehow it's factually wrong. Uh, however, uh, I would suggest in the future that if you want to do a survey, do a survey. But if you want to do polling, that uh, there are science uh, practices that would allow for it. Uh, really, uh, I would like to just take this limited amount of time and say uh, to Dr. McClellan, you, you're here, and, and, and to Mr. Rawl, you're both here on your own dime. You're both experts in. in and historically, can you give us briefly in the remaining time uh, a contrast between today and the period of time in which you served? Because quite candidly, uh, I wasn't here during the Clinton administration and then a Republican majority, but I'd like to have a contrast because I'd like to understand, do you believe that there is uh, somehow a, a rapid change in the way the administration works with your, agent, your former agencies? Uh, or is it substantially the same and we're simply seeing it different because we see it through different eyes? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I'd be very pleased to address that. As I noted in my opening remarks, uh, I've been associated with the EPA and its advisory structure from the beginning of the agency. At the time the agency was created, I was chair of a committee which is advisory to the U.S. Public Health Service. That function was brought into EPA, and thus I became a part of the Science Advisory Board at its beginning. I'll have to say that controversy has been a part of the fabric of the EPA since its origins. And it has been a part since the passage of the Clean Air Act, which preceded the, uh, the agency. Indeed, one of the first activities I participated in was a visit to Research Triangle Park in the early 1970s as we were putting in place the first air quality standards. And we went there based on concerns 
that came to the surface with a, a headline story in the LA Times about the question of whether scientists were being pressured to come to a particular viewpoint. Periodically over time, we've seen these uh, controversies. It is natural because you have science, and scientists are not without their own emotions and their own judgment. We're passionate thank, about thank the you. use of our science. So I, appreciate it. And, and I don't see a big spike. Thank you. And, and Mr. Rall, just very briefly so we sure, can go Mr. to our vote, I'm afraid. Well, <clears throat> I think there has not been uh, as much change as it may appear uh, listening to, to only one hearing. I think President George W. Bush has not been a potted plant with respect to environmental rulemaking in his administration, nor have his predecessor presidents been potted plants. Uh, President Clinton was very involved, President Reagan, President uh, Carter. Uh, all very involved uh, in, in rulemaking. President Reagan, of course. Uh, We're going to have to. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. If you'd put on. the rest well, in for the record, I would very I appreciate much appreciate that. I wanna, it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, it was interesting, your discussion of the proper role of the President agency decisions, and I don't believe it's central to the issue before us today. Um, Mr. Rao, even though you assert that the President can direct the Administrator's decision, do you agree that the President must follow the law? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. And so when the President intervenes and makes a decision on the secondary, or when he intervened and made a decision on the secondary ozone standard, his decision still had to meet the requirements of the Clean Air Act? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, the Clean Air Act requires EPA Administrator to identify level of air quality requisite to protect the public welfare from any known or anticipated adverse effects associated with the presence of such air pollutant in the ambient air. Mr. Gu, is it your position that uh, scientific evidence available to the administrator and the president that the secondary ozone standard was set at a level requisite to protect the public welfare? No, it is, it is not my opinion. Uh, the unanimous recommendation of CASAC uh, was that the, the form of the standard not be the eight-hour standard. Uh, the basic point here is that plants and foliage respond differently than human lungs do. The eight-hour standard was set uh, uh, to protect human lungs uh, okay. and human respiratory function. The, uh, so whoever standard, set that standard, whether it was in fact the president or the administrator, you don't think it, it fits with the science? That is correct, And, and therefore the Clean Air Act requirement. That is correct. And uh, Dr. Griffo, uh, your survey is important because it provides us with a big picture of political interference with the work of scientists at EPA. Uh, almost 1,600 EPA scientists filled out survey questionnaires and sent them to the Union of Concerned Scientists. And they, they, they had cases where EPA political appointees had inappropriately involved themselves in scientific decisions or interference from political appointees from other parts of the administration, like the White House and EPA scientists who were directed to inappropriately exclude or alter technical information from EPA scientific documents. Uh, their survey shows that there has been a serious problem of political interference with the work EPA scientists under the Bush administration, and that, I think, is unacceptable and has to stop. I thank the four of you very much for your testimony. And we'll hold, keep the record open in case there are other thoughts you want to submit to us for the record or questions that members may seek to uh, ask. That uh, concludes our hearing. We stand adjourned. George Gray admitted the numbers were bad. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. Kentucky and Oregon voters are picking a potential Democratic presidential nominee today. Together they control a little more than 100 delegates. Former First Lady Hillary Clinton